let's start. So can I please welcome everyone that's uh, come to, uh, to, to join us today uh, to talk about uh, competency-based medical education in, in the UK. And it, it's, um, it, it's exciting having people from so many organisations. I'm, I'm not going to get you all to introduce yourselves because there are about 30 attendees and we, we don't have a lot of time, but we've got people from Egypt, We've got people from Royal Pindi and Lahore in Pakistan. We've got uh, colleagues from Hangzhou in China uh, and from India, people from Kochi, from Mangalaru, from Kano and, uh, and New, New Delhi. And uh, finally, we've got some colleagues from Dubai. So uh, a, 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 a great, uh, a great, uh, interesting uh, group of people who are interested in learning uh, what we do. It is going to be quite intense because we normally run this over a whole day face to face uh, together with an evening event and clearly we're trying to pack everything in to a, a very short period of time. If you have any problems uh, then you can put it in the chat or or email will or phone will. I, I presume will everyone's got your phone number. Um, so if, if there are issues, please contact Will and he will do what he can to help. Because of the shortness of time, there may not, and there are so many delegates, there may not be uh, a lot of time for discussion. So uh, I, I would like people to use the meeting chat box to put questions. Uh, I will try and answer some of them, uh, apart from when I'm talking, as we go along. Uh, and some of them we, we may hold hold back and and discuss uh, later. But I think that would be a good way of dealing with with questions. As I said, there is a huge amount to get through. And um, like a lot of things in medicine, there are a lot of words to learn. There's a lot of jargon. And I was just looking at just looking at the agenda. And we've got IMT, SLE, MSF, ACAT, MRCP, ARCP, and JRCPTB. So even on our agenda, we've we've got jargon and and uh, and words that that uh, may not be obvious to all. Um, but hopefully, as we go through, people will be able to understand what we're talking about. Uh, and there will be a degree of repetition. Uh, as we go over uh, important things, for example, like the ARCP, the annual review of competence progression, uh, 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 several several times it will be mentioned during the the talks. So um, I think, uh, unless Will, you want to say anything else, then I will head into the first session. Okay. So our objectives for today, the, the first one and the most important is to help you all gain an understanding, particularly of the UK internal medicine training programme in the context of competency based medical education. Uh, and uh, although we will be particularly focusing on IMT, we, we will be talking about other higher training programmes because virtually everything we do occurs across all our programmes. Uh, so the, the same structures and processes uh, and indeed many of the outcomes are, are, are the same across all, all our programmes. And then secondly, uh, is to help you understand how the Federation of the Royal Colleges of Physicians uh, can help on an international basis. Uh, and indeed, we will have already had conversations with, with many of you uh, in the past some of whom are, are long-standing partners of the Federation. Next slide. So what is the Federation? Well, it, it is a, an organisation that brings together the three UK Royal Colleges of Physicians. It is confusing why we have three, but we do. One based in London, Liverpool, one based in Glasgow, and one based in Edinburgh. And they're all extremely old and venerable organisations uh, who, who, who are, are like to uh, 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 compete with each other. But because in the UK we have a single training system and single curriculum required by our, our uh, 
uh, by our regulator, the General Medical Council, then uh, we have to uh, work together through the Federation on all curriculum and examinations. So there is only a single uh, UK, uh, MRCP UK, and there is only single curricula in the specialties of medicine. So uh, Federation does that. It supports, in part, trainee progression through training. It's our job at the end to inform the GMC that we believe people have completed training. Uh, we work with the General Medical Council and the postgraduate deaneries, which we shall talk about in a minute, on the quality management of training, which is really important to us. Next slide. We've got 29 specialties and three subspecialties, so we have to set and review all the curriculum assessments for all those specialties. They're all competency based with workplace based assessments and all require at some stage the passing of the MRCP UK diploma. And, and we, we do our work through the 32 specialty advisory committees. Next slide. Uh, because of this, we, we have uh, 32 e-portfolios, although they're all based on a single model. Normally, we would show you uh, a session on using the e-portfolio. Uh, we haven't got time for that today, but that's something that we could arrange in the future if people wanted it. Uh, as I've already said, we monitor people's progression to the point at which they get their certificate of completion of training. That's a CCT. And we deal with things like out of program, people going out to do research or, 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 or other educational activities. And, and, and finally, we, 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 we run uh, penultimate year reviews uh, before people complete training to assure ourselves they have covered the curriculum. Next slide. So let's get down to start the beat. What is competency-based medical education? And as I think I put on one of my previous slides, uh, you, for, the, for, the, for today, just assume that if I use the word capability or competence, that they're the same thing. I'm sure lots of academic papers have been written on the difference, but for today, please assume that they are the same thing and that competence or capability is the ability to do something successfully and efficiently. And at the heart of it is to focus education and assessment on patient outcomes. So what that really means is to focus on how the doctor performs in real life. Because that's because we need to measure that. Firstly, to say that they are a safe, competent, professional doctor. But also, if we can't measure it and describe it, we can't change that behavior. So that is fundamentally the difference between a, a, a form of education, which is simply an, an apprenticeship and you pass an exam or an exit exam, uh, but is this, this focus on everything that they do. It hopefully emphasizes their abilities and and uh, the feedback they get is, is is how they can do better not what they did badly it tries to de-emphasize time-based learning it, it it doesn't entirely uh there is uh, there are arguments about expertise and time but it, it we are less focused on time uh, than we've been in the past and we try hard to individualize our training plans for the learner next one so in terms of, of uh, measuring uh, performance, as I've said, what we want to try and do is to measure what people do in the workplace. But it's really difficult. If we look here, we know how to do a knowledge tests. They're easy, multiple choice questions. So we do a lot of it. We can have structured questions like the MRCP part two written, uh, which again, allows them to demonstrate knowledge in practice. We're going to talk about how we then use PACES, the, the, the practical assessment of clinical examination skills, which shows that people can do things with that patient in that certain examination environment. But what we're really trying to do through competency-based education is to assess what people are doing in the workplace so that we can help them improve. And it's the most complex bit, and therefore why competency-based medical education is challenging. Next slide. So a, a couple of slides. So exams 
are necessary, but they're not sufficient. None of our exams are exit exams. Next slide. And, and it's impossible, in my view anyway, to do competency-based medical education without having effective governance. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is what that governance is that makes it possible to both train and assess people uh, uh, in, in a defensible way. So next slide. So as I've just said, exams are necessary, but not sufficient. We're not training doctors to pass an exam. They've got to pass an exam, but we're not training them as the objectives to pass the exam. We're training them to become great doctors for patients. Therefore, there has to be a very structured process for delivery and decision making about progression in training. And we've got to have assurance processes to be able to defend those decisions. It's easy to defend failing someone on an exam. It's much harder to defend judgments made about professional performance, but we have to do it for patient benefit. Next slide. So I, I just wanted to make a, a few slides about how how the structure in the UK, this, this may not be so important, but you will hear some of these, 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 these words. So firstly, the colleges, the Royal Colleges, we set the standards and the curriculum, and we run these specialty advisory committees that help us build those curriculum uh, effectively. And at the end of the day, our job is to tell the regulator that they have completed training. We have a very strong uh, UK-wide regulator called the General Medical Council. Uh, it, the parlance is they're the competent authority in the United Kingdom for all decisions around uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate training. And indeed, they're responsible for people from the moment they go to medical school to when they finally leave the medical register at the end of their career. We then have organisations called postgraduate deaneries, which organize the training at a, at a sort of regional level. Uh, in many countries, this may be done by the Royal Colleges, and indeed, we used to do that till about 1994 in the UK, but things gradually changed. And these postgraduate deaneries are responsible for making sure that all the doctors who are in training in the UK are being uh, properly managed, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, the trusts or hospitals are where, like in your countries, you're delivering education as part of service. Next slide. Uh, crucial people for physicians are the head of school of medicine in each deanery. So there will be a head of a school of medicine who will probably be responsible uh, for around maybe five or six hundred uh, doctors in training uh, in, in, uh, in, in a geographical area with 12 or 15 significant hospitals. So obviously there are professional administrators who do it, but the head of school is a very important clinician uh, who, 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 who is in charge of medical training. And then they have working for them training program directors who deal with each specialty, because as I've said, we've got 29 main specialties and three subspecialties. And then finally, uh, at hospital level, there are the educational supervisors uh, who are doing the the day-to-day -day supervision with clinical supervisors. So you'll be hearing throughout today about training program directors, educational supervisors, and clinical supervisors. They're all part of a structure of how education fits together. Uh, next slide. So what do these schools of medicine in the deaneries do headed by the, the School of Medicine? Well, they have it, it, a number of roles. Firstly, recruitment of trainees. So in the UK, recruitment of trainees is done on a national uh, open competitive basis. Uh, but it is managed uh, at each region by the head, heads of school. But it is highly structured uh, and to be uh, as, as equal and fair as we possibly can where we're taking people into training. Uh, and I think it's, it's 
just interesting to to say that the 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 head of school the 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 the, the deaner is uh, own half the salary of every trainee. So these are uh, important decisions. Secondly, those school of medicine plan the program. They look at the curriculum and they make certain that all aspects of the curriculum are being delivered. Uh, too often, a curriculum or even just a syllabus is a document in someone's bottom drawer that nobody ever looks at. Uh, and, and it is really important that people are covering the curriculum because we are going to assess all of it. They're there to do trainee management if there are uh, difficulties with the trainees, be those uh, professional difficulties or personal difficulties, uh, and it is, or, or people with disability. Uh, so it, it, they're very involved at supporting uh, trainees to get as good a training as possible. Uh, each year, there are ARCPs, annual reviews of every trainee in the country. We'll hear more about that later. Uh, we're going to be talking about Mumtaz. We'll be talking about the ARCP after our break. But you'll you'll be hearing about the annual process. There in the UK altogether, there are fifty six thousand trainees, and every one of those has an ARCP every year. But we do interim meetings during the year to ensure progress is being made. The schools of medicine do hospital visiting for quality, and they're very uh, involved in trainees in difficulty. Next slide. So we have a quality structure. Uh, I, I've mentioned the GMC as being the rational regulator, the postgraduate deaneries as working on delivery, and then the local education providers at the trusts or the hospitals where people are actually working and getting training. And, and we as colleges uh, work uh, particularly with the, the GMC and the postgraduate deaneries. Next slide. There are two key documents in the United Kingdom. The first is the curriculum, which is more than the syllabus, which is what you've got to learn, but is everything around it, how you're going to be, what the assessments are going to be, the rationale for it, how the training program will actually be delivered. So the what and the how of training. And that where we work, say, for example, with one of our six UK equivalent uh, partner sites internationally, they deliver that curriculum. Uh, it is the same uh, curriculum. But there's another book in the UK called The Gold Guide, which you only look at if you want to go to sleep at night, which is about the administration and the rules about how it all works, how an ARCP works, who's a trainee, who's not a trainee, how will recruitment be done? So these are not part of the curriculum, but they're how locally uh, we will make this all 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 work, and and that it, 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 it has again when we work internationally, people will have to set up their own rules because people have different HR practices, for example. Uh, 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 but that's not actually part of the curriculum. So in, in my last slide, just to say what's in the next slide, please, will. So in, as I've just said, in this gold guide, which is not the curriculum, it says who does what, what's an educational supervisor, how should they be trained, what, how programs are approved, what is the quality management, what are the roles, who is in training, who is a locum. It, it, it is a rules book, but it is not the curriculum. And we will be talking mostly about the curriculum today. OK, well, we're, we've okay. got, as I said, I mean, please put if you're. Please put your question in the chat box, and as as Mike talks, I am happy to try and answer any that are that are put up. So I'm I'm really pleased to park a, pass over now to Mike, who is now the medical director of the Joint Royal Colleges of Physicians Training Board, the JRCPTB, one of those uh, one of those pieces of jargon, uh, and uh, he has to make it all work. Your, it's all yours, Mike. Thanks very much, David, and thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I, there are a number of acronyms that will come up, and I'm sure that uh, there will be lots of people able to interpret these acronyms if they are obscure. Some of them are indeed very obscure, but my remit is to actually look at where, where the IMT programme in the UK has come from 
how it's now functioning. So to give you a broad overview. Uh, next slide, please, Will. So to give context, I've got to uh, consider a little bit of history. Um, prior to 2007, the ways in which trainees uh, exited from medical school went into their original pre-registration jobs and then subsequently trained in physicianly specialties was a, a little bit um, variable. But in August 2007, a specific core medical training program was developed with a syllabus and a spiral curriculum to ensure that the competencies that um, David's already alluded to could be acquired and that these would be assessed by workplace based assessments and that there would be a formal structure of educational and clinical supervisors to provide support to trainees as they were being trained. Next slide, please, Will. But there were subsequently reviews of uh, training right across um, the whole of medicine. Uh, this included a paper called The Shape of Training, um, which was delivered now somewhat to my surprise as I was looking this up quite a long time ago in October 2013 which suggested that the way we were training doctors was perhaps not the most appropriate for the future of the population and the comorbidities and the management of patients as we move into the future of delivery of healthcare. In association with this, the Royal College of Physicians also set up the Future Hospital Commission to look at how hospitals in the future could be run and deliver the care that was necessary to the population. But there was also a report uh, led by um, a chap called Francis, who actually looked into some of the shortcomings of care and tried to ensure that what was going to be delivered in the future was going to be appropriately caring and regulated to ensure that we were really delivering high quality care. The General Medical Council, the GMC, also uh, decided to deliver a generic professional capabilities framework, i.e. something that they believed that every doctor in the UK should have in terms of capability. But they also then reviewed um, in January 2016 the standards for medical education and training, including curriculum design and how curricula were to be developed for the future. So a lot of um, papers were delivered that were going to affect the way we were providing training. Next slide, please. The physicians also recognised that there were a number of drivers that um, were going to influence how we were training doctors for the future. Whilst we had the educational supervisor and clinical supervisor um, structures, the curricula were very much based on the, the minutiae, going down into a a, a, an, an attitude which some people call the tick box mentality and being the medical registrar was thought to be increasingly unpopular because of the pressures that were put on the medical registrar and at the same time how we were going to ensure that that job and that very important job in the hospital was providing proper education, proper training, but also pro providing proper job satisfaction. The quality of training had to be um, there to ensure that people would be attracted to physician roles. But the burden of assessment associated with this tick box mentality became very much a difficulty for trainees coming in. There's also difficulty with the flexibility of work force provision. Um, whilst the UK is a very small country compared to many from which you come, um, it is fair to say that the geographical disparity in terms of the availability of the workforce was um, difficult. Within the flexibility of workforce provision, there were role changes. Specialist nurses were coming in and the junior doctors felt that some of their roles were being removed from them. 
There are also new procedures, treatments re requiring workforce uh, changes, uh, e.g. cardiac surgery, once a very popular modality of therapy, but as the physicians learned how to do um, uh, intervention, then this became less important. And so we needed to make sure that the flexibility of the workforce was there. And there's also the changing demography of trainees in the increasing feminization of the workforce, which of course many of us applauded. Um, so we had to respond to all of these pressures and in particular, the shape of training report, looking for an improvement in the generalist abilities within the workforce as a whole, but especially the physicians. So an internal medicine committee was established in August 2015 by David, who was then the JRCPTB medical director, with a variety of subgroups to ensure that this was delivered appropriately and implemented appropriately. So the curriculum and syllabus subcommittee was led by a physician called John Firth from Cambridge, who's a nephrologist. The assessment subcommittee was led by the then medical director of the MRCP, um, Andrew Elder, who's now president of the Edinburgh College. And the implementation subcommittee was led by David Marshall, who is now chair of the heads of school which David uh, alluded to earlier on, earlier on as the workforce within the deaneries for physician training. There was a huge consultant, consultation exercise to look to see if this um, internal medicine committee was getting it right. The trainees obviously were critical in ensuring that this was an appropriate way to deliver training in internal medicine. But the SAC, the Specialty Advisory Committees, the Heads of School, the Core Medicine Training Advisory Committee, the employees, uh, employers across the country, the postgraduate deans, the GMC, were all consulted and there were significant development days um, to try and ensure that there was a an acceptance that this was the right way to proceed. And there was also a proof of concept study which demonstrated that changing the curriculum was going to be the right way to proceed. Next slide, please. So what were the headline changes? Instead of the core medical training program, which had previously been two years, the internal medicine training program was projected to be for an indicative three years. The GMC make it very clear that any time constraints now associated with training are indicative. Um, and this is something that David had alluded to, that we what we're trying to do is ensure that trainees gain the relevant competencies or in this situation what were called capabilities in practice. This was to look at high level assessment of how a trainee was progressing rather than looking at the atomized competencies that had been part of the core medical training uh, curriculum. A simplified syllabus was delivered and trainees were to be assessed as regards being entrusted at defined levels of supervision and I'll come back to that in a minute. There were specific experiences mandated for instance whilst it had been recommended in core medical training that there had been outpatient experience this had been variable and one of the concerns from trainees but for the first time it was mandated that critical care experience was gained but also, and in bearing in mind the increasing age of the population, experience in um, medicine for the elderly or geriatric medicine was absolutely mandated. But more to the point, internal medicine was in inextricably bound to the specific specialty training that people would go on to take. That was then going to be determined according to the multiple specialties that the physicians were um, associated with, but it was felt that more specialties should start doing internal medicine training in association with their higher specialty training. As David has alluded to, internal medicine training is an integral part of what we're trying to get the majority of physicians to do. Next slide, please. 
What didn't change is that the fact we was we had to have supervision, both the clinical supervisors, those that act within the environment directly where the trainee is practicing, and the educational supervisor who would take a broader overview of how the trainee was progressing through their training program. The annual review of competence progression has already been mentioned and I'll not take that any further, but workplace based assessments were also going to be an integral part of how trainees were proving that they were generating competence and capability. All trainees within the physician specialties would still need to pass all parts of the MRCP to be allowed to progress into higher specialty training. But overall, medicine itself wasn't changing. There was not a need to try and um, change how medicine was being delivered, apart from recognition that the population that we are serving is continuing to change. And also some of the therapies and treatments very uh, well exemplified by the recent pandemic can change really quite rapidly. Next slide, please. We were under an absolute mandate from the GMC that training could not be lengthened. We already have a fairly significant um, extension of training um, compared to perhaps some of our European comparators. But we believe that the quality output from our training programmes was of an essence to how the NHS and those doctors who would practice elsewhere in the world should be um, getting to their level of co capability and competence. If there is a greater emphasis on internal medicine training, however, the effects on higher training had to be addressed. And so in consultation with the GMC and indeed um, the four nations that comprise the UK, it was decided that there needed to be some separation of specialties into group one, which would include internal medicine training throughout training, including the higher specialty component, and group two specialties, those specialties which perhaps traditionally had not continued with internal medicine practice once they had been uh, trained in that specialty. Therefore, the group two specialties are those um, internal medicine um, training programmes which will not continue with internal medicine after the stage one of internal medicine training. Next slide. This shows the specialties which are in continuing with internal medicine training on the left hand side, the group one specialties and the group two specialties are on the right hand side. Although it looks like there are more specialties on the right hand side, in terms of number of specialties, that's absolutely true. But in terms of the number of trainees who undertake training on that in the group two specialties, that's about 20% of our overall specialty trainees. The ones in yellow on the left hand side are the specialties which will now continue to train in internal medicine throughout the training period. And these are the so-called new group one specialties where genitourinary medicine, neurology and palliative medicine will all train in internal medicine. And also for the first time, neurology uh, trainees will all train in stroke medicine as well. So there is an increasing number of trainees who are undertaking internal medicine training um, compared to those that would have taken it um, previously when these specialties were not doing the complete internal medicine training program. The other slight difference is that the group one specialties will all do internal medicine training phase one for three years indicative, whereas to enter for the group two specialties it is possible for trainees to leave the internal medicine training program phase one after only two years of training, but it is left to the individual trainee to determine whether they stay on for the third year or not. Next slide, please. 
So this is a schematic to indicate how training for the Group 1 specialties would be undertaken, starting on the left hand side with foundation training and then entering into internal medicine stage one training for an indicative three years with the mandatory items of acute medicine, including the acute take, outpatients, geriatric medicine, critical care and simulation being um, an integral part of that training. And there would be a specific requirement to demonstrate that the trainee was able during this time to take on the medical registrar role. There would then be subsequent recruitment into the chosen specialty where they would undertake training in that specialty and also continue their internal medicine training for one year of the indicative four years of the specialty programme. During that time, they would also undertake a knowledge based assessment, the specialty certificate exam run by the uh, colleges and association with the specialty. At the end of training, as uh, David has already alluded to, they would receive a CCT, but would also be able to continue training by undertaking credentialing if that was a significant specialty area that the trainee or uh, then trained doctor would be wash wishing to undertake. Moving on to the next slide, please. In comparison for group two specialties, the internal medicine stage one training could be only two years. They would not need to manifest the uh, abilities to take on the medical registrar role because this would not be something that they would be doing during their specialty training um, as they would no longer be involved in the acute take. Their specialty training would still be an indicative four years and similarly once they get to CCT they would then be able to undertake post CCT credentialing if this was thought appropriate for their career progression. You will notice that in both special, group one and group two specialties workplace based assessments run through the whole of training. Next slide please. So internal medicine training is the spine of the whole period of training for group one specialties. But it is outcome based, based along these capabilities in practice or so-called SIPs, which I will um, outline a bit further uh, in a minute. This training is mapped to the GPC framework, um, the General Professional Capabilities Framework produced by the GMC. The stage one curriculum for the first three years was approved by the GMC on the 8th of December 2017. You can tell from the fact that we're outlining the precise date, this was a big red letter day, and was subsequently implemented in August 2019. The stage two curriculum has been approved and will be implemented from August 2022. Of course, um, as people use the phrase, the perfect storm, one could not have anticipated that implementing a brand new way of training physicians would suddenly be impacted upon in such a um, dramatic and dreadful fashion as the as it has been by the pandemic, um, which we're all aware of. Next slide. Capabilities in practice is derived from the entrustable professional activities described in the literatures. And basically it's a unit of professional practice identified as a task or responsibility to be entrusted to a learner to execute unsupervised what sufficient competence has been demonstrated. So from that point of view, we can say that somebody who has no experience at all and no capability um, cannot be allowed to progress and undertake a specific um, area of practice. By the time they've reached level four of practice, then we believe that they are able to execute this particular area of practice in an unsupervised fashion. Next slide, please. There is, of course, compromise. 
Um, we can't just say on a high level perspective about a trainee, they're a good trainee and therefore they can do anything. But the old fashioned way of looking at a trainee who could look after heart failure, but couldn't look after somebody with pneumonia is also far too detailed and probably inappropriate for the manner in which medicine is practiced. And so what we're trying to do is identify a trainee who gets most of the um, capabilities, who is able therefore to practice internal medicine to an ability where they can undertake the acute take, looking after both the acutely ill patient and indeed looking after patients who are then transferred to inpatient beds. Next slide, please. The internal medicine SIPs, there are six generic and eight clinical um, internal medicine SIPs. Each of the higher specialty curricula have also generated their own um, SIPs specific for their specialty, but within the group one specialties, as I've already alluded to, these internal medicine SIPs sit alongside the specialty SIPs. Each of the SIPs has descriptors of observable skills and behaviours and all are mapped to the GPC domains. Every SIP has a list of evidence that can be used to inform entrustment decisions. What we're trying to say is that trainees will have workplace based assessments, but at the same time, they need to be listing these to, so that they can be taken into account for each of the SIPs to be um, acknowledged by their clinical and educational supervisors so that the, at the annual review of competence progression, the trainee is shown to be demonstrating the high level outcomes which are appropriate for them to be allowed to proceed further in their training and eventually to um, CCT. Next slide, please. This is very difficult to see, but is essentially a um, generic SIP where the, it's shown that the trainee can communicate effectively and able to share decision making while maintaining appropriate situational uh, awareness, professional behavior and professional judgment. And as I've dem uh, suggested already, there are descriptors, how it's mapped to the generic professional capabilities and what evidence might be used to inform the decision. And these are all contained within the internal medicine curriculum and indeed with the, within the higher specialty curricula so that we know that for this SIP, this is how it could be demonstrated. And for the other SIPs, there are similar listings as shown in the next slide. For the internal medicine SIP 4, which is managing patients in an outpatient clinic, where we're again providing descriptors, the GPCs and the evidence that can inform the decision. Given that the pandemic had influenced significantly the number of outpatient clinics that were occurring, and I think it's fair to say that for a time outpatient activity had been decimated, we had to introduce a new um, workplace based assessment called the OPCAT to facilitate trainees demonstrating their skills within an outpatient environment. And that's not listed under the evidence to inform decisions and is now a new way of demonstrating capability in this for this particular SIP. Next slide. As I've already indicated, there are separate entrustment levels. Level one, entrusted to observe only uh, not providing clinical care. We would hope that the vast majority of trainees coming into in, uh, internal medicine training programs would not be at this level, that they would have had some experience of most of what we're teaching at some stage in the earlier part of their career in the foundation level. However, we then do need to look at how we assess against level two, level three and level four, 
level four being the level to which people have to aspire to achieve their CCT certification. Next slide. As we've developed internal medicine training, we tried to suggest there should be a focus um, for each year. As I've already alluded to, the pandemic has um, dealt this a fairly significant blow, but we do believe that we have got things back on track. And indeed, the vast majority of trainees are a, have been able to progress through internal medicine training at an expected rate. Um, when we've looked at the recent ARCP outcomes, something like 1% of trainees are being kept back because of difficulties in achieving relevant capabilities. So we think that we are providing a good training environment despite the pandemic, certainly not because of it. Internal medicine year one was the assessment of the acutely ill patient and the management of the acute medical intake of patients. That is to make sure that trainees are truly able to manage the more acutely sick patients um, as they are learning their trade. In the second year, the experience was supposed to be mostly in outpatient clinics, but I think it's fair to say that the continued experience for the first intake of uh, internal medicine training has been mostly managing acutely ill patients. We are now entering the third year. Um, we have just entered the third year of training for the first cohort, and this is now primarily involved in the acute take and functioning with the breadth of um, training that is necessary to be the medical registrar. Can these individuals run the acute take with the appropriate prioritization, time management, team management, and at the same time, taking into account their ability to manage patients clinically? Next slide. The syllabus is very much a restricted syllabus for internal medicine because it is a simple list of the diseases that we know that trainees need to be familiar with, either because they're common or because and or because they're important from a patient or public health perspective. The syllabus was developed with input from the specialty advisory committees right across the relevant medical specialties, but we are not trying to specifically define knowledge skills um, or any particular area here because it is the application of the knowledge and skills that we're really trying to assess as people move through internal training, uh, medicine training. So what we are saying is that people will have to have the knowledge to be able to pass the MRCP, the ability to apply these knowledge within MRCP part two, and be able to demonstrate they have the relevant skills in the PACES exam. And that still remains a critical part of the assessment profile within internal medicine training. Next slide. I've alluded to already the experiential learning but just to specify that we did say for the acute take there needed to be 100 patients a year with 500 over the three years minimum. That in the NHS as it stands at the moment is really not too much of a problem for any trainee in internal medicine training. In critical care, we suggested that they should have at least 10 weeks over three years in a maximum of two blocks. We are trying to ensure that this is developed further so that we will be insisting that it should be a three month attachment, um, preferably in a single block, because we believe that that gives the best um, immersive experience of uh, critical care. I mentioned 80 clinics for active involvement over the three year period. It was supposed to be a 20 per year with the maximum um, exposure being in the second year. We've had to modify that particular target as we're looking to try and ensure that people have the capabilities and 
enabling people to use the OPCAT to show their capabilities in the outpatient clinic. We've also um, looked at geriatric simulation, geriatrics and simulation to ensure that these specific areas are covered to ensure that A, the patient needs are being satisfied, but also that patient safety is being maximised. Next slide. As usual, compromise too prescriptive makes it impossible to deliver in localities, but with greater flexibility, nothing will change and poor practice will persist. So we've got to make sure that this is implemented appropriately. Next slide. I've already alluded to the fact MRCP is a substantial piece of evidence and we should not forget that this is a critical part of the assessment of the um, trainee as they're moving through training. Next slide. So how do we monitor progress using the e-portfolio, the workplace based assessments? We do get the clinical supervisors to generate consultant reviews. The ARCP has been mentioned and will be mentioned again, held in the deanery in each year, and we will review each year's outcomes to determine progression. Next slide. Mike, can I suggest yeah. we just stop there? I think the next two slides are not critical. Fine. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Well, great. I mean, it, it is a really impossible challenge to try and give a complete overview of, of where we've come from, why we've done it and how it works in, in, in such a short period of time. One of the papers that was sent out in the pack was uh, a paper by Alistair Miller, uh, and it do he does very succinctly uh, cover the whole, all the issues of what the curriculum is, why it is, and how it, 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 it works. So re really a, a very key paper to read uh, to follow up from this uh, 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 event. One of the diff differences between the UK and overseas is that uh, all, well, while, as Mike has shown, uh, almost everybody trains for three years in internal medicine, we don't have standalone consultants uh, in general in the UK just in internal medicine. So we, we dual train, and that, that is a bit different to how some other countries work. But absolutely at the heart of our curriculum are these 14 capabilities in practice that we review with a trainee at the end of every year uh, at their annual review of competency progression and which they must get eventually to level four by the end of training uh, as well as passing their exams. So this principle of, of setting up uh, measurable, defensible uh, uh, workplace-based uh, assessment uh, is 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 key to it. And, and this then leads on to our next speaker, who is uh, Sue Pound, who, like me, is a geriatrician and uh, she's a vice president uh, in the Edinburgh College. And she's going to talk about how uh, two of, we have a fair number of uh, workplace based assessments, but how two of the really key ones feed in to that decision making process around the 14 SIPs and subsequently the annual review of competency progression. So if I could pass over to you, Sue. Thank you very much, David, and hello, everybody. Um, well, next slide, please, thank you. So Mike has mentioned a couple of things that I want to pick up on in my talk. He's mentioned the importance of capabilities in practice. And these capabilities are subdivided into uh, two different types, if you like. Uh, the first are those of the generic capabilities in practice, and they cover universal skills which are crucial to safe and effective patient care, such as communication, team working, uh, the ability to lead that team and patient safety. And that sort of um, hung on, if you like, three key generic areas of professional knowledge, of professional skills, and particularly values and behaviours. And the reason I mention this is that one of the uh, SLEs or workplace based assessments I'm going to comment upon is that of the multi source feedback, which looks specifically at these values and behaviours and ability to communicate. The second type of, of competency or capability is around clinical skills, and they cover the clinical tasks or activities that are essential to the practice of internal medicine. 
and they uh, one of the workplace based assessments that um, provides feedback on clinical skills is the ACAT or acute care assessment tool. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at these capabilities, we have to have some form um, of assessing them. Mike's talked about the different types of assessments and we have summative assessments and formative assessments. One of the key elements that feeds into the annual review of progression is the educational supervisors report. And we believe that it's important that that report is informed by evidence gained from multiple sources so that you have many different consultants or colleagues who are able to feed back and comment on how well you are progressing in your training. And that evidence might come from many places. It might come from an examination. It might come from an a summative assessment, such as your ability to perform a procedure. It might come from feedback on performance from many other consultants, but it also comes from formative assessments uh, that are performed in the workplace. Next slide, please. We have a whole list of different workplace based assessments and I've been asked to speak to you today on two of them. Um, the acute care assessment tool, which is a clinical feedback form and multi source feedback, which is, is much more looking at those generic competencies. The other tools we use are around case based discussions, uh, mini clinical evaluation exercises, directly observing whether a trainee can perform a a practical procedure or not, feedback from patients and feedback on your ability to do um, a quality improvement project or to teach others where, where be they um, other doctors, medical students or allied health professionals. Next slide, please. So the process of workplace based assessments, um, they, they should be trainee led. So as, a, as an educational supervisor, um, it should not be up to me to go chasing my trainees to fill out these forms. Trainees should identify a learning area, a learning experience, be that a ward round, a clinic or an interesting or particularly challenging case. They should discuss with a senior clinician and receive constructive feedback. They then submit a form which is completed and uploaded to the portfolio and they're then able to link that form as evidence that they have acquired certain curriculum competencies. So whilst the process needs to be trainee led, it's clearly important that trainers are engaged in this process. They should be trained in giving feedback because these forms really only work well if the feedback is constructive. And trainers should encourage their trainees to identify and to take learning opportunities. Next slide, please. So supervised learning events, workplace based assessments are a form a formative assessment. They're an assessment for learning. It's not a pass or a fail. It's not like an examination. The aim is to identify the trainee's strengths, what they're doing well, and to identify potential weaknesses or areas for improvement. And they're a process um, of encouraging progress by identifying the learning needs and then by providing feedback to the trainee. And they try and assess what the difference is between the trainee's current skill level and what might be an expected standard for a trainee of that grade. So a junior trainee should not be assessed against the standard um, of a consultant. A junior trainee should be assessed against the standard of a junior trainee at ST3 or 4 level. But most importantly, trainers need to be able to give direction to their trainees as to how they improve areas for further development and specific guidelines about how they might do that. Next slide, please. So the first tool I'm just going to talk a little bit more about is the acute care assessment tool. Now this has specifically um, been designed to assess and facilitate feedback on a performance during acute medical 
practice. So be that on the acute medical take, which is perhaps the most common area where we tend to fill these forms in, but they may be also used in other settings where multiple patients are seen with acute medical problems, including an outpatient clinic, an ambulatory care clinic, um, a hospital at home ward round, for example. And they are most effective and most helpful to the trainee when they are filled out very shortly after that learning experience. So straight after a post-take ward round, for example. The areas of assessment include the ability to prioritize or time management, to be able to work effectively across a, a, a large take, for example. So it's not just about discussing a single individual patient. It's about the ability to work with and lead a team and to interact with other colleagues. Next slide, please. It also looks so at the clinical component of, uh, of, of the doctor's practice. It looks at clinical assessment, management of patients, their clinical decision making, but also their ability to document that decision, case, in, uh, decision making in record keeping and the ability to hand over uh, patients who require follow up of tasks, for example. It looks across, as I've mentioned, multiple patients and the time period um, of that assessment. But it can also be used for feedback um, in, the, in the care of individual patients if there's one particular complex case. We do ask for a minimum of five cases for each ACAT assessment. Next slide, please. The components of the assessment are to request from the trainee a brief summary of the cases observed. And the supervisor is then asked to comment on clinical assessment, the investigation and management plan, judgment, um, uh, judgment uh, expressed, and professionalism. Next slide, please. The supervisor must then feed back to the trainee areas that are done well, suggested areas for development, and then, as I've mentioned, based on those observations, a rating is the training doing as well as you might expect for their level of training. Are they actually exceptional? Are they above the expectations for the year of training? Or are there some areas where they are struggling and perhaps below what we would expect, in which case feedback as to how that trainee can develop becomes even more important? Next slide, please. This is a very busy slide and I'm not going to go through it, but it just gives you a flavour of how the trainees describe their cases. So, for example, an elderly patient, fall, delirium, and then some discussion about what happened um, on, on the post-take ward round or on the assessment of that patient. And trainees are last asked to list the cases that they discussed with their supervisor. Next slide, please. As I say, there should be a minimum of five, uh, but there are often more. Next slide, please. And an example of feedback from a trainer might go along the lines of, for clinical assessment, this trainee has taken time to review correspondence, the results and the findings. They have good clinical examination skills and have tailored that examination to what is required. The ma management plan is proactive, um, it involves the patient in creating that plan. Communication skills are good in speaking to the patient and to staff. Next slide, please. And clinical judgment is good. Medical management has been proactive, but also pragmatic, perhaps, in the context of frailty. Patients and families have been involved in decision making and um, appropriate judgment as to when tests um, are appropriate or required. And a judgment from the trainer that professional management um, has been good. Next slide, please. Feedback about what was done well um, is included here. So timely assessment, good interaction, person-centered approach, but also areas for development have been identified and encouragement to use other members of the team when doing a post-take war round. So this might be a more senior trainee who's perhaps still doing all of the tasks themselves and being encouraged to move up to that next level. Next slide, please. So that is the acute care assessment tool and, and it's a, I hope have given you a flavour of how that tool works to provide feedback. 
The second tool that I'm going to discuss is that of a multi-source feedback, which is an, a method of assessing those generic skills I mentioned at the beginning. It obtains feedback on the performance of a trainee from several colleagues. Those raters are people with whom the trainee works and are not just medical staff, but should include certainly nurses and other allied health professionals and perhaps administrative staff if appropriate. The trainee does not see those individual responses, so um, those providing feedback know that they are doing so in an anonymous way and can therefore be um, honest um, to the trainee. And feedback is collated and then given to the trainee by the educational supervisor. Next slide, please. The trainee should discuss the range of raters with their supervisor. There must be at least three consultants and a minimum of 12 assessments are required within a three month period for the multi-source feedback to be valid. We also ask the trainee to fill out a self-assessment. It's exactly the same form and it gives a really good feel, I think, as to the trainee's insights about where their own strengths and weaknesses lie. Trainees can see um, who has responded. So if they've sent out 15 forms, they can see perhaps the one or two that, uh, that they need to chase up for, uh, for feedback, but they don't see the ratings or comments. Those ratings and comments are then pulled together by uh, the system, uh, discussed between the supervisor and the trainee at an appraisal meeting. And then those collated comments are released to the trainee so they can see the verbatim comments, but not the, um, the trainer or rater to whom uh, they apply. Next slide, please. Raters are asked to um, rate the trainee um, in a number of different areas on a scale. It's a five point scale from well below expectations through meeting expectations to well above expectations. And the areas that are assessed are communication skills with patients, communication skills with staff, their attitude to patient and staff, their ability to work in a team, and whether they're reliable and punctual and showing leadership skills. And then raters are asked to assess overall professional competence. Next slide, please. Finally, raters are asked um, uh, whether they have any uh, concerns about honesty or integrity of the trainee to identify some good areas, good areas of practice to provide positive feedback and also to describe any behaviours that have raised concern so that we can provide constructive um, suggestions and ideas for development. It's not about negative feedback, it's about identifying areas that are less good and providing specific advice as to how to improve upon that. Next slide, please. So um, briefly, just some types of comments that we might see on a multi-source feedback form. Um, so for example, Dr. Smith is an excellent communicator, communicates well with patients that, that is appropriate. I think her kind demeanor puts people at ease. But equally, there might be some areas where trainees are struggling. So feedback might be Dr. Jones seems to shy away from difficult conversations, especially where there is bad news to discuss. He would benefit from some training in this area. So that's a, a helpful comment that allows an educational supervisor to identify whether perhaps a specific course or maybe a session with a palliative care consultant might help in that trainee's development. Next slide, please. Similar examples from working with healthcare professionals. Dr. Smith works well, is considerate uh, and, and lovely to work with. Or uh, on the flip side of the coin, perhaps I find Dr. Jones quite intimidating on occasion, as she doesn't always seem to value my opinion in team meetings. Again, it's quite a specific comment, which allows the educational supervisor to provide advice on development. And I think that's, that's something to, to be aware of in all feedback from all of these workplace based assessments. Comments that just say, well done, or not bad, or could be better, are not helpful to the trainee or to the supervisor. Identifying specific areas that the trainee does well, or specific areas where the trainee 
um, can improve allows us to form um, a, a, an individually based plan for that trainee uh, to, to, to forward their development. Next slide, please. And again, some examples of um, good uh, feedback, uh, areas where a trainee has, has provided excellent, um, so a fantastic doctor and team mender, Having this more senior doctor as an FY1 on my ward has been brilliant. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, workplace based assessments help us as, as educational supervisors to build a picture of trainee performance in the workplace. It helps to inform that very specific educational supervisors report and the two uh, workplace based assessments I've discussed, the APAT, ACAT provides feedback on clinical skills as well as time management and team working, the MSF on communication skills. They're formative assessments, not pass fail, and constructive feedback is crucial um, to their success. Uh, I think that's my last slide, Will. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sue. That, that, was, that was brilliant. I think give hopefully gave people a real feel for how to use uh workplace based as, as assessment i mean the, the hardest thing i think for most uh, doctors is to give uh, constructive feedback on how to do better and and that's why they need uh, help with training in our programs we always insist on the trainers being trained and we're going to hear more about that after 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 uh, coffee uh, and of course we need multiple observations. This isn't just a one off. It, it is multiple ob observations, multiple observations feeding into your MSF summary, multiple ACATs and other things over a trainee's year, which is all summarized in the e portfolio, which is why the e portfolio is a crucial tool at making this work uh, for for uh, for tra trainers. So so thank you for that. Um, I'm afraid we have to keep moving on, but it is the last talk before coffee. And uh, I'm pleased that we've got Donald, Donald Farquhar, who's who is uh, like, in fact, like Sue and myself, a, a geriatrician, um, but is absolutely our guru on paces and international paces. Uh, and as we said at the beginning, exams are necessary, but not sufficient, but they are necessary. So, Donald, the MRCP. OK, thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation to talk uh, this morning. Uh, what I really have is about 15 minutes to talk about uh, the role of the MRCP examination in internal medicine training in the UK, but also I want to talk about MRCP as an international uh, standard exam uh, that's available, uh, obviously, in many countries. Uh, you may well have seen this slide already. But just to say that there, to explain the Federation, we have three colleges uh, of physicians in the UK, and they all come together uh, in federated activities to do with training of physicians, examinations and continuous professional development. The examinations that the Federation are involved with are the MRCP uh, diploma that you can see on the left hand side here. Uh, and we also run specialty certificate exams, which are computer based uh, uh, multiple choice exams uh, that are exit exams, which all consultants in the UK will need to have passed before they gain a completion certificate as a consultant. I'm not going to say anything more about those, but merely to concentrate on MRCP. Uh, next slide. Sorry, that's the slide we've had. Uh, so that just really details the specialty certificate examination uh, specialties and shows MRCP. Uh, next slide, please. This is gives you an idea of the of the sort of uh, scope of MRCP, uh, both in the UK and internationally. We do operate the written exams in about in over 50 countries. Uh, and MRCP PACES operates in about 18 different countries. Uh, it is a large organisation. There's 36,000 questions in our question banks, which are constantly reviewed, renewed and rewritten. 
And the PACES exam itself uh, is the largest international clinical bedside exam uh, with over 2,000 examiners, the majority of whom are actually outside the UK. Next slide, please. So as David said, exams we feel are necessary, but they're not the be all and end all. So we feel that trainees in going through their internal training, uh, internal medicine training, need a mix of formative and summative assessments because that encourages the attainment of the required skills that we're looking for. So the IMT programme provides the trainees with the training experience and multiple formative assessments that you've just heard more details about from Sue Pound. The MRCP is really a, a formal summative assessment looking at knowledge, bedside skills and communication. Next slide, please. This just gives further details about the, the specific exams uh, and they are effectively part one and part two are written qu uh, multiple choice questions with best of five answers. Uh, and they are very, uh, they are, are very rigorously uh, produced uh, by very expert psychometricians and clinicians. PACES is an, a clinical OSCE exam. Next slide, please. So part one is really uh, goes back pretty much to basics. It's checking knowledge and that knowledge is about common uh, medical uh, disorders, but also goes back to the basic science behind those disorders. So it gets our trainees to go back to really first principles uh, about what they are actually doing in practice. Next slide. Part two, having proven their basic knowledge and their basic science knowledge, really requires them to use that knowledge with applied clinical reasoning. So part two provides details uh, of clinical scenarios and then candidates have to prioritize uh, what's the most likely diagnosis, what uh, are key investigations, what's the important immediate management. So this again is a knowledge-based exam, but in a much more applied clinical reasoning. Uh, next slide. And finally, we come to PACES, uh, which really is an exam very much looking at bedside clinical skills, which in the UK are regarded as crucial. Really, the, the unique selling point of a physician is their ability to sit at the bedside and to gain information from real patients in real time. And what we're looking for here is assessing them on their certain specific clinical skills. Can they examine the patient appropriately in a structured uh, and, uh, and reasonable manner? Can they identify abnormal physical signs and not make up signs in normal patients? Can they communicate? Can they actually come up with a differential diagnosis uh, and in the UK, that's a differential diagnosis in the UK. But if the exam is being held in another country, it's the differential diagnosis for that patient in the country where the exam is being held. Clinical judgment is thinking on their feet. Can they think of appropriate investigations or management for the patient they're seeing? So you can see that this is that this exam is about demonstrating bedside skills in real patients. So it's about using their knowledge, but in an applied practical way with a real patient sitting or lying in front of them. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea about the, the PACES carousel. Uh, so it, they, there are effectively uh, eight encounters over five stations, and six of those encounters will use real patients with abnormal signs, which we are expecting the candidates to find. Uh, if we go uh, through it, there are 10 examiners. Uh, that is, uh, they will all mark independently. They've all gone through a training system to become PACES examiners. 
and internationally there will be there are usually five UK examiners and five examiners from the country where the exam is being held. They mark completely independently. There is no collusion or discussion before the marking. Candidates are observed at all times during the exam when they're in the stations and the pass rate worldwide runs at about 50 percent. Just looking at the carousel, uh, the, 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 if we go from the top, the first two are physical examination of of the of the pulmonary system and abdominal system. And uh, then there is the ability to take a history, the ability to examine the cardiovascular and central nervous systems. Communication skills is not about the candidate's ability to gain information from patients. It's very much about what is the candidate's ability to communicate medical uh, information in plain English to, uh, to patients and to their relatives. And the last two, integrated care, is around uh, sharp, rapid fire uh, integration of both focus history and examination. Next slide, please. And we feel that the PACE's clinical exam is, is crucial because I, if, if candidates, if the trainees know they're going to be examined in bedside skills and they need to pass a, a, a summative assessment of bedside skills, they will work hard to improve those skills which we feel are essential. And our regulator, the General Medical Council, is also very clear uh, that uh, they expect doctors to demonstrate professional values and standards uh, which are assessed uh, in the PACES exam. They need to be courteous, polite to patients, uh, need to be good communicators, not cause them pain, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, and really, I, I think we do that and we feel it's important because there, there is much more to being a good physician than what you know. Uh, and around the, uh, you know, in the UK and around the world, all the people who sit paces have passed our knowledge-based exams. So they all have the medical knowledge, but I have to say that we, we meet candidates in paces who I would never want to let loose on a patient uh, myself because their performance as a, in bedside skills is very inadequate. So you need this exam, we feel, uh, to actually uh, to prove that you're a good physician. Next slide. This just gives you a, an idea of the, the, of the really extent of uh, the MRCP exams. Uh, so we do operate, as I said, in many countries for the writtens and our SCE exams. PACES is the more complex clinical exam, and this just gives you an idea of where we are operating at the current time, although clearly there have been some difficulties in delivering a clinical exam uh, during the pandemic, both in the UK uh, and internationally. We actually have 26,000 candidates per year sitting all elements of the MRCP diploma, and the majority of those candidates are, are actually international candidates sitting in international centres. They outnumber the candidates sitting in the UK. Next slide, please. So why are we getting so many international candidates? And I, I, I'd just like to give you a flavour uh, of the international uh, reach of the exam. Uh, in, in some countries, it's all about career progression. So, for example, in Singapore and in Hong Kong, the MRCP is actually a mandatory requirement for training. You need to have passed this exam before you move from internal medicine training into specialty training as a cardiologist or a gastroenterologist. Uh, in other countries, uh, a number of which are now over, well, they are producing very many undergraduate doctors, 
but have insufficient postgraduate uh, training places. One such example is Malaysia, where there are now 7,000 uh, doctors graduating every year, but only about 1,000 MMED training places. So 6,000 doctors a year are wanting to prove that they are wanting to specialize. Uh, so what, how do they prove that? And in Malaysia, uh, because of the difficulties, they created what they call an alternate pathway, whereby uh, if a doctor completes three years of medical type jobs in government hospitals and passes the MRCP exam, they are regarded as equivalent to a NEM med completer and can apply for specialty training in a medical specialty. Uh, and now in Malaysia, the majority of people applying for specialty training in Malaysia are going through that alternate pathway. In India, which again massively overproduces, uh, it well doesn't, it is producing many more doctors than there are places in MD programs or DMB programs. Uh, there, uh, the, the, basically, the Medical Council of India uh, recognizes MRCP as a postgraduate qualification and allows somebody who has MRCP to apply for academic medical posts. Uh, it also, uh, around the world, can improve terms and conditions for work and in the longer term may also improve uh, opportunities in private practice. So that I think there are many reasons why uh, doctors around the world are sitting MRCP. It does also have advantages if you wish to come and work in the UK. You do not have to pass the licensing exam, which is called PLAB, to enter the UK. If you have MRCP, uh, you get you can get temporary registration with the GMC on the basis of having MRCP. Uh, next slide, please. This slide really just looks at our candidate figures over the last 20 years, and you will see the steady rise in numbers uh, as we've got in the last 20 years. Uh, part one, uh, the first exam. Uh, candidates, international candidates are increasing over the period from 1,000 to over 6,000. And our PACES candidates now are from no international places to uh, approaching uh, 2,500 international places. So uh, we are trying to expand and we do feel that running this exam internationally uh, is, is a fairer for and better for candidates. It saves them the cost of having to travel to the UK and they are sitting in their own country where they're seeing patients and therefore need to think of their own differential diagnosis and their own management. So we think it is a fairer assessment of bedside skills. Thank you very much. That's my last slide and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you to all the presenters for, for keeping to time brilliantly. We, we, we've provided an awful lot of information in the last hour and a half, and uh, it is time now for a short break to have coffee or tea. Or, um, but I, I would encourage people uh, to spend uh, five of those minutes just reading the one of the, the papers that we put round with the with the uh, the the presentations, the one on the future of internal medicine by Alistair Miller. It does cover all the areas that we have done this morning, hopefully in 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 a very succinct fashion. Uh, and I hope you'll understand that what we're trying to uh, produce through our training problems are expert professional physicians who 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 are who are able to meet all aspects of patient needs. We we will be talking later. Or I talked right at the beginning about uh, uh, the training is focused on patient outcomes, which is about having uh, expert physicians in everything that they do. And if we don't assess things in general, trainees will not learn them. So we need to assess everything a doctor needs to do. 
So uh, I see um, I see uh, one person has said, Will, that they have not received the papers. So um, please, could you send those to uh, dot, dot, Dr. Mittal, uh, as, as well as to anybody else that hasn't received them? If you email Will, he will, I hope, send those back uh, straight to you. Please I will, keep... David, apologies. Fantastic. Well, I, I suspect it's got uh, it's got uh, lost somewhere. I find things appear a few days later or in trash or in some way that you don't expect it. Um, so um, uh, I think we will break now. Um, please, you, if you want to keep asking questions on the chat, uh, when I've had a cup of coffee, I will come back and answer them. Uh, and if not, we will start promptly at uh, I think it's 10.55 when uh, Mumtaz will be talking about the ARCP and how each year all this is start brought, brought together. So uh, please have uh, a break uh, and I'll see you back at 5 to 11, our time. <laughs> OK, uh, well, uh, welcome back. Um, I think most people have, uh, are still here, which is great. Um, so we're moving into the second half of this really intensive uh, session and uh, our next speaker is, I'm pleased to uh, to uh, introduce is Dr Mumtaz Patel who is a nephrologist uh, she's the uh, current global vice president of the RCP in in London and Liverpool and she's also an associate dean uh, in the in the uh, postgraduate deanery uh, up in the north northwest so uh, another expert physician educator who will be talking about the annual review of competence progression that we have mentioned uh, occurs every year to all trainees in the uk uh, and is fundamentally part of uh, how the competency-based medical education works so over to you mumtaz Thank you, David, uh, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Um, lovely to sort of see and hear you all. Um, so I've got this session for about 15, 20 minutes. So I was going to give you a little brief outline of the ARCP process, both in the UK and um, internationally as well. So Will, will you be able to move on to the next slide? Thank you. So the outline of my talk is just um, uh, shown here. And what I was going to go through was a little bit around the background of what um, the standards are, what's the purpose of the ARCP, and go through the actual process, both in the UK and internationally. Um, as David has alluded to, I've been involved with some of the international work for some time now, and I've done some of these ARCPs internationally, both in person and virtually, so I'll talk through a little bit of that as well. And then importantly, how do you best prepare both from the educator side as well as the trainee side for a successful ARCP? What are the trainee and trainer responsibilities, the decision aids, and a little bit around um, the ARCP outcomes and the quality assurance process? Of course, uh, COVID has impacted all of us, and I'll just touch on how that's impacted on ARCPs as a process um, in the UK and internationally as well. Thank you. Will, next slide, please. OK, so just starting off a little bit around the background. So as you know, to set the scene, the GMC, our regulator, the General Medical Council, sets the standards for postgraduate training here in the UK. We have a gold guide um, of which is different editions, and that's the reference document for postgraduate specialty training in the UK. And I put some references at the bottom just for, you know, kind of your information as well. And the trainees progress through and ultimately join the specialist register by going through this ARCP process. And I'll talk a bit about the decision aids because that facilitates our kind of panel decision. It's mapped to the curriculum and it states exactly the requirements of a successful ARCP. And I'll go through that as we go along as well. Next slide, please, Will. So going through the definitions and purpose, so as David mentioned, the ARCP is, stands for Annual Review of Competence Progression. So as the name suggests, it happens on an annual basis. It's a formal process that reviews the evidence presented by the trainee. And you've probably had some discussion around the portfolio and the importance of that. But basically, we review the evidence that's presented and it's trainee and trainer responsibility to make sure that that's kind of up to date. And it enables the trainee 
us uh, from the deanery perspective, the postgraduate dean and employers to make sure that the capabilities which are required at each stage of training are being met. And that's demonstrated um, by the appropriate evidence there to demonstrate that experience. And it's an important process for appraisal as well as for revalidation. And as I've mentioned, as the name suggests, it should be done annually. But, you know, again, even even in COVID times, you know, kind of sometimes these annual sort of points have been missed, but within a 15 month period to facilitate the revalidation process. Next slide, please. Bill. Thank you. So what is the process? So it's done as an independent panel, which is managed kind of through the deanery, the school, the program. Internationally, it's the IMT program leads who do it. It's run by the training program director with the appropriate educators um, uh, sort of forming the part of the panel. And it's informed by the documented evidence as mapped against the ARCP aid, decision aid, and that's all based on the portfolio evidence. And it's a hierarchical process. So you've got your clinical supervisors and, you know, kind of the portfolio evidence, which kind of is forming the part of the evidence that's got gets reviewed. And the educational supervisor reviews all that evidence, collates and does the educational supervisor report, which is critical and pivotal to this process. And all these things need to be satisfactory to allow the progression of the individual trainee. I can't emphasize enough how long the process can take. So particularly when you're new to the program, I would always say, you know, kind of the preparation towards the ARCP process should be commenced at least three months before the end of the training year to make sure all the evidence is collated um, and, you know, kind of then reviewed in a timely way. Thank you, Will. Next slide. So preparation for the ARCP. So who does what? You know, so as I've mentioned, there's the supervisor responsibility from the education supervisor perspective. And then there's the trainee responsibility to make sure the portfolio and things are up to date. But who does what? So I'll go through that on the next slide. Will, please. So when you're looking at the preparation for the ARCP, the trainee responsibility. So the trainee takes primary responsibility for their training. It's a trainee led process, all of these things. But the educational supervisor, of course, particularly for new programs, as well as established programs, gives that guidance to that individual trainee. We would make sure uh, or ensure that the trainee is organising the regular meetings with their supervisor and we recommend the initial mid and end point meetings. But together with that, we would also recommend a pre ARCP meeting at least six weeks before the ARCP process. We want the trainee to engage with their portfolio, make sure all the assessments are done and they complete the full ARCP paperwork, paperwork on time. And then from the educational supervisor responsibility, I guess here, and we would hope that, you know, with new programs being established as well, the educational supervisors are given that time to meet with their trainee within their job plan, set their personal development plan, as well as their targets of what they need to be achieving through their training year, and then support them through their training year to make sure that evidence is being recorded on their portfolio and they're meeting their competencies and capabilities in practice. And there's different curricula for different specialties and things, but for the purpose of IMT, I'll go through that um, in the next few slides as well. But as a supervisor, you need to make sure all the paperwork is completed on time and not to treat this as a tick box exercise. I know he, even here in the UK, sometimes that's how it gets perceived from the portfolio side. But, you know, the, the portfolio in itself is an important tool to drive learning as well as the RCP process. So I, I would always advocate that that's how it should be used. Next slide, please, Will. So from the pre ARCP meeting, so as I've mentioned, in, in addition to the, the three required um, meetings that we would recommend for the appraisal meetings, I would also advise on a pre ARCP meeting with the education supervisor around six weeks, six to eight weeks before the ARCP. And the purpose of that is to review all the requirements mapped against the decision aid. If there are any gaps in training or any requirements, then try and establish a plan early of how the trainee can achieve them, 
discuss any uh, concerns ahead of the ARCP. And I always say there shouldn't be any um, any you know kind of uh, um, sort of things which are hidden or come up as a as a surprise at the ARCP. Hopefully, it's all done in a planned and scheduled way, so there's no surprises at the end. Um, so, you know, we have a form R also for completion that's more for revalidation purposes as well. Um, and that kind of makes sure that if there are any incidences or any other issues, then those are documented ahead of the ARCP. So next slide, please, Will. So from the planning perspective, again, splitting it up into trainee and trainer um, sort of uh, responsibility side. So from the trainee side, making sure all the required assessments are completed, they self assess against the capabilities um, against the curriculum, making sure their evidence is clearly presented. I say it's like taking responsibility yourself because this is showcasing all the work that you've done through the year from the trainee perspective as well and any other evidence like reflective pieces, et cetera, are completed. And from the supervisor side, I guess they need to make sure all these assessments, evaluations are completed, all the reports are completed in time. If there are any concerns from previous, then all those kind of recommendations have been met and ensuring all these tasks are completed. Next slide, please, Will. So I've talked a lot or mentioned the decision aids. So what are the decision aids? These are kind of um, targets which are defined um, to be achieved for a satisfactory ARCP outcome at the end of each year. This is standardised guidance that's produced by the Joint Royal Colleges of Physicians Training Board. It's on the website. It's mapped to the curricula um, and it, the process itself in this guidance improves the consistency of the ARCP panels. And from the trainee side, it helps the trainee to ensure that the portfolio evidence is available for each of these requirements. And like I say, it's published on our sort of website of which the link is shown there. Next slide, please, Will. So this is an example of the decision aid, um, which you may have seen, but for the internal medicine uh, training curriculum, this is our sort of decision aid for the stage one training, which is what we're talking about today. So it shows the requirement by training year, what kind of things are required. So a supervisor report is required every year, the generic and clinical capabilities, all the different bits, what, what is required at each stage. Um, so that's very clearly defined. And this is what I would say to discuss at the outset of training with the trainees. So they're fully aware of what the requirements are. And then at each stage of training, you're mapping your um, ARCP sort of outcomes based on the decision aid and what's been achieved through that period. Next slide, please, Will. And going through the capabilities in practice. So with the internal medicine curriculum, um, I'm sure that's been described where we have these generic and clinical capabilities in practice. And again, each of these are very well defined uh, within the curriculum as well as the decision aid. And what level of capability needs to be achieved at each stage is defined. And this is what you're assessing at the time of the ARCP to make sure that these capabilities have been achieved and there's ev evidence to document that along the way. Thank you. Next slide, please, Will. So looking at the evidence, what is the evidence that you're looking through? So we want to make sure that all the appraisals have been completed. There's a personal development plan at the outset of the year to make sure that that's mapped against what the requirements are. All the relevant workplace based assessment supervised learning events are completed, the reflective practice. If they've attended teaching, you want evidence around that as well. So it captures everything in a systematic way of the evidence, both the clinical evidence, the teaching evidence, as well as kind of the wide, wider portfolio uh, um, assessment and evaluation. And the supervisor report is pivotal to the ARCP. I can't emphasize this enough. And the quality of the supervisor reports we've shown impacts on the ARCP outcomes. But this is where we start off when we look at um, our uh, doing the ARCP and the evidence as well, because a lot of the evidence is summarized within the supervisor report. So a good quality supervisor report is essential for a successful ARCP outcome. Next slide, please, Will. So decision making, how does the process work? So after all the preparation and the planning towards the ARCP from the trainee and trainer perspective, you get to the ARCP. 
and that's done in different panels. So you've got your panel A, which reviews the evidence. Now that is normally a panel of three. It could be the training programme director, a couple of supervisors and educators to make up the panel. However, it, the educational supervisor for that trainee shouldn't be making the decision around the progression of that individual trainee. But this could be done virtually, and certainly in the COVID times, we've been doing all these, a lot of these panels virtually, or it could be a face-to-face -face meeting. The panel B is where you meet the fa uh, trainee face-to-face -to, -face to discuss the outcome. And again, that could be a satisfactory or, you know, kind of um, a non-satisfactory um, uh, standard outcome to discuss that with the trainee. And that would normally include more the training program director, myself as associate dean when I sit on these panel and or a lay, rep lay representative. And that's particularly when there are underlying issues with um, sort of trainees or within the program. And trainees can appeal the ARCP decisions, um, you know, that we do get that very infrequently, though, um, but there's a process around that as well. Thank you, Will. Next slide, please. So in addition, you know, kind of with the panel, we try and have an externality process to make sure that, you know, there's um, the process is fair, it's equitable to all. So we have at least 10 percent of random sampling of portfolios and the ARCP outcomes, which are done by an external reviewer. We have externality as in external advisor reports as well to the ARCP panel to make sure, again, there's consistency of process. And again, like I say, sort of if the, the trainees are not making satisfactory progress, we'll ensure that they have either a face to face or a virtual meeting with the individual trainee, as well as their supervisors thereafter, and they can agree on an action plan to achieve those targets as well. And annually, we would recommend at least you know, one meeting face to face with the training program director or the college tutors, depending on the, the, the nature of your programs. Thank you. Next slide, please, Will. So what are the outcomes? So these kind of this slide summarizes some of the outcomes. So you have a satisfactory progress um, outcome. That's what you want all of our trainees to be achieving. And then the outcome six is when they've completed their training program, whether it's the internal medicine stage one program or the specialty training program as well. And then there's different outcomes also outlined there. So outcome two, when they're just missing a few specific competencies, but then you make a plan to achieve those. There may be times when they're not making adequate progress and additional training time is required. And we see that sometimes, particularly for exam um, sort of progression as well. Outcome four is very rare. You know, that's when there's underlying major issues with training um, sort of trainees or sort of the program aspect of it. And then outcome five, sometimes there's only a few things missing to, which needs to be completed to ensure a satisfactory outcome. So that just gives you a bit of an outline, outline around the outcomes as well. Next slide, please. So the quality assurance process, again, just to briefly mention. So as I've mentioned, the ARCPs are done locally um, within the local education offices or the deaneries by programme and specialty. We'd advise on the, this pre-ARCP portfolio review at least six to eight weeks before the ARCP, and we have an externality process, as I've mentioned before. We have decision aids for all vision, physician specialties, and we provide external advisor training as well in different forms to, again, um, inform sort of the process and also ensure consistency as well. And we have various reports at different levels which go upwards through our management training boards, which are outc ARCP outcome reports, both um, our UK reports as well as internationally, as well as the external advisor reports as well. Next slide, please. And lastly, just to say around the impact of COVID. So, of course, COVID has impacted us all in different ways, but certainly for the ARCP process, there's been a big shift to virtual ARCPs as we couldn't do a lot of these things face to face. So a lot of the panel A's and also panel B's have been done virtually. Even some of my ARCPs that I did for India and other places were done virtually as well. And even if there was panel feedback which was required for the trainees, this was also done virtually using these platforms. 
A lighter touch approach was applied certainly last year with minimum curriculum requirements ascertained and revised decision aids and ARCPs were prioritised for trainees with significant concerns as well. So kind of some impact there as you would expect. Next slide, please. And lastly, just to say pros and cons, reviewing the process over the last kind of year, 18 months wise. So the pros from the virtual ARCPs have kind of reduced or amount of travel. We've been able to do the ARCPs both in the UK and internationally virtually. It's been convenient in a sense for the panel members. It's reduced time for travel as well as cost saving from you know, the, the major travel aspect side of things and time as well. And we've revised the decision aids, as I've mentioned. We have created disruption forms for trainees who've um, obviously training has been disrupted as well to then hopefully forward plan what we can do to support their training. But of course, there's always negatives with these things as well. IT issues, particularly with these platforms and things, the feedback, particularly when there's trainees requiring additional support has been challenging as well. And sometimes the messaging, particularly in the earlier times of COVID, um, there was ambiguity around what messages were coming out, mixed messages and advice from different stakeholders. And then there was various other issues, particularly for trainees who were more at risk groups as well. Next slide, please. So in summary, just to say that the ARCPs, as hopefully I've um, outlined, is a very important process required to facilitate progression of trainees through their training programme. Of course, a successful ARCP requires engagement both from the trainee and from the supervisor, as well as the programme management and preparation and planning, as you would expect, are key for a successful ARCP. The decision aids are absolutely, you know, kind of crucial for defining these targets and hopefully achieving a successful ARCP. And we have a good quality assurance process in place to hopefully drive the quality of the process. So I hope that's been helpful and I'm very open to any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, much. very, very good uh, uh, overview of the ARCP. And so again, just to emphasize that uh, even if you've passed your exams, you have got to have a successful ARCP in order to progress or to complete training. This is absolutely vital. And of course, underpinning it is the evidence that's being held in the ePortfolio. And all that evidence has to be open. They can't, there's no secrecy. There are no secret forms that go around. Uh, it, it's all there. Everything your supervisors say has to be in the e-portfolio so that it could be seen uh, by all all parties. And I, I think that's that's uh, again very important if you're going to uh, defend uh, uh, your decisions and, and indeed to help trainees uh, improve. So um, I, I'm just going to keep keep moving on. And uh, our next talk, we've we've, we've talked about. Uh, earlier, uh, the roles, uh, a little bit about educational supervisors, clinical supervisors, and uh, they have got to understand what those roles are, and they've got to be able to give uh, feedback in order for trainees to improve and to know how they're going to do it better. So um, we need to train the trainers. So uh, Tom Baker is the Deputy Director of Education and the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians of London, Liverpool. And he's going to talk about how he's worked with JRCPTB over the years uh, to support trainers and provide relevant training programmes. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you, David, and thank you for inviting me to talk to you all today and welcome. Um, so, as David said, my name is Tom Baker. I am Deputy Director of Education at the Royal College of Physicians of London, um, and I've been involved in supporting um, organisations implement both core medical training and internal medicine training um, in our international sites. So all of our international partners, I've had the pleasure of being there to um, train and help support the implementation of the curriculum. Um, so next slide please Will. So in this short time together what I'll be going over is why train the trainers, so the importance of that, to how, how to go about training the trainers and thinking about the process of faculty development. Next slide, please. So I've got a question for you all. You've all heard um, all of the wonderful talks about the curriculum um, and the complexities that are around it, some of the uh, 
perhaps negatives that might come with implementing a new curriculum, but all the positives as well that come with introducing a structured training program. So in the, the, the chat on the right hand side, I'd like you to just add to there. Why is, do you think it's important to train the trainers? What are some reasons that we might train the trainers? So I'll give you a few moments just in the in the chat window. I'd like to understand your reasons why we might train the trainers. So yeah, um, Adithi, so absolutely uniformity in training. Yeah. We've got that twice. So yeah, absolutely thinking about uniformity, a balancing act which is interesting and we'll pick up on that in a moment. And to keep updated about the curriculum, yeah. So all of these are very good ideas and if we just go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so training the trainers, so these are the people who are going to be supporting your trainees um, to be able to navigate the curriculum, but also more importantly to be successful in that navigation of the curriculum. And so having trainers who are expert in that curriculum is really important. And the training of the trainers and making sure that people um, have a complete understanding means that they understand their role and the expectations of being a supervisor. And that comes back to um, Dr Akshay's comment here about a balancing act. So as you know, as you experience, your day to day clinical life is very busy. So picking up extra responsibilities that are linked to supervising a trainee on a new curriculum is going to require um, a, a careful balancing act of those responsibilities. So having a really clear outline of what the expectations are of being a supervisor is really important. So what is my job as a supervisor and what should I be expecting my trainee to be doing? To have a complete understanding of the curriculum, that obviously goes without saying. So you may not know it word for word, but you'll absolutely certainly want to be knowing the main areas that are in the curriculum so that you can have a good understanding to support your trainee. Understanding the assessments at the assessment systems, we heard before about the complex process of workplace based assessments that sit alongside the college exams and thinking about the methods of assessment, how to do those effectively and how to get the biggest educational impact from assessment is something that's really important. That's a really important role of a trainer. And linked really closely to that is thinking about appraising. Um, so how can we make sure that our learners are making the right progress? How can we support them through educational meetings and discussions and make sure they've got the opportunities they need to be successful? And if we train the trainers in this way, that enables us to have consistency of the, that application of standards across the whole organisation. So it means that no matter what uh, supervisor you have, they're all able to do the same thing in the same ways. And that's really important when you're looking from a trainee perspective, but also an important aspect of the um, quality assurance process that David was talking us through earlier. So thinking about then linking to this uh, targeted support for trainees is really important. And you've heard us talk about this phrase before, trainees in difficulty. And now this might be a trainee who is struggling for a particular reason, either to do with a knowledge or a skills gap or a behaviour issue, or it could also be trainees who are facing particularly difficult circumstances in their personal life, which is impacting on their role in, in, in work. So having opportunities to get trainers together to talk about, well, how do you support all of these different individuals to make sure that they can reach the end point so they can progress and indeed complete training? Next slide, please. So how do you go about training the trainers? And the first stage is really is identifying who are the key people that are involved in implementing a curriculum. And we've heard um, right at the beginning the important role of the training program director. So this is that person who locally is in charge of the training program, who ensures that all of the trainees have the right um, environments, experiences and opportunities that are linked to the curriculum, um, but also have the overarching view of, of everybody that's involved. And it's their role to ensure um, that not only that the trainees are progressing, but that there are uh, appropriately trained supervisors to support the programme. 
And two key roles here really are the educational supervisors and the clinical supervisors. And it's the educational supervisors who manage the holistic development of a trainee and the clinical supervisors manage that trainee in a particular clinical environment. So if they were doing a rotation, say in cardiology, it would be the clinical supervisor who's managing that trainee day to day in order for them to develop their capabilities. People quite often forget that a key faculty member as part of implementing a curriculum is actually the trainees themselves. So ensuring that the trainees have got adequate training so that they know what the expectations of them are. Next slide, please. So quite often we hear people say, well, this all sounds great, but we already have a faculty that have experienced educators. So people who we trust, who are experienced teachers, um, who may have supervised other people before in different training programs. But why do you think it is important to still provide experienced educators with additional training and support? What might be some of those reasons? So you might be sitting there thinking, well, this is great. I have a team of, of great teachers here locally, but why might they still need to have some support and training? Advancements in technology. Yeah, so we've heard about the e-portfolio. The e-portfolio undoubtedly will be new. That will be something that supervisors or educators locally won't have used before. It's a big part of the curriculum and actually to be able to navigate the e-portfolio takes time and it takes um, support. So that is absolutely something that um, local educators will need if they are to take on the role of a supervisor. And Professor Azim's talking about continuous professional development. Absolutely. As a, an experienced educator myself, I know that I don't know everything and particularly I don't know things about something that's new. So having that support will enable me as a professional to be able to discharge my duties, as particularly if I'm going to take on a supervisor role. Dr Malik saying that medical education is changing, needs updates. So we have seen in the UK, you've heard that the, a rapid development in our um, UK curricula means that absolutely medical education is changing all the time. Um, and so having those key points of, of opportunity to update people, to enable them to have the right knowledge, skills and behaviours to be um, to excel in their role as a supervisor is really important. Um, Dr Vishnu is talking about to fine tune to meet the exact requirements. Absolutely. So being able to supervise on a new curriculum isn't something that we should just um, assume that people will be able to do just because they're an experienced educator. Um, and thinking particularly, um, uh, Aditi is talking about the assessments here, that a lot of these assessments might be totally new and particularly the way uh, and the mode of feedback will be new. Um, so it's important to make sure that people are set up for success. So next slide, please. So if we're thinking about educational and clinical supervisors and everything that they need to know in terms of being able to do and execute that role successfully that actually implementing a new curriculum and having excellence in medical education requires well-trained faculty of clinical teachers and it's not just teaching knowledge and skills we're talking about actually supervising an individual's uh, professional practice being able to conduct assessments, to interpret those assessment outcomes, to discuss them with the trainee and to come up with a, a decision about somebody's progression. And supervisors require specific skills that are linked to the curriculum in order to do this. An important one is around appraisal and the mode of appraisal for this curriculum that we're talking about for internal medicine is very specific and it's probably different to um, different ways that uh, experienced educators might be used to in terms of appraising students progression and actually when we're thinking about the holistic uh, uh, assessment structure in this curriculum it's really important that supervisors understand how to utilize all of these different aspects of information in order to uh, enable somebody's progression it's about giving effective feedback and we spend a lot of time when we train supervisors really unpicking well what does that mean and how can we do it to the best effect 
it is about teaching. It's not all about teaching. So um, trainees will be going through um, a, a formal teaching process that might be delivered by others. But as a supervisor, you will be teaching uh, and supporting your students or your learners development in that way as well. As we said, those specific skills around assessments, so really understanding the assessments and how they work and how they integrate into the curriculum. And also considering, again, how we support underperforming trainees and what specific um, actions can we take to get people back on track. Next slide, please. So that all sounds great, but that's very complex in terms of supporting professional educators to be successful. And what we have developed over the course of the past few years in supporting our international partners is a faculty development program. And this program is a full package. And when we say a full package, it really is full. It's an extensive package of support for both the learners and for the supervisors. Um, and it involves bespoke training materials that are um, adapted and amended locally so they meet your needs, that they meet the needs of the gold guide that you're going to be creating, the assessment structures and the opportunities that your um, trainees will be um, exposed to. And it includes um, uh, expert educators from the UK. So I'm usually part of that team, but as well as myself, um, other experienced medical education lists, as well as experienced supervisors who work in the UK who really know how to implement um, the process of supervision locally, who are able to troubleshoot issues that supervisors might be coming across and coming up with solutions that work. Our faculty development program that we've developed isn't lecture based, so it is truly interactive and I'll show you example of the, the program that we um, deliver and actually it's about practicing skills. So it's not just about listening to us, it's about actually having a go in a safe environment. So when a supervisor has a trainee in front of them, they know exactly what to do and how to be successful. And as I've said, that it's fully tailored to meet local needs. So this isn't just um, a, a package that we roll out across every single um, organization. We actually make sure that it's tailored to meet the, the needs of, of you locally. Next slide, please. So we've talked about the package, but what actually is in there? And really, um, there's two different aspects to this. The first aspect is, is what you can see on the screen here. And usually we would do, run this program three months before the curriculum implementation date. So three months before you actually want to start with trainees. And this involves a comprehensive development program for the educational and clinical supervisors. And we spend a lot of time here to really understand and unpick what do we mean by the role of an educational and clinical supervisor? What actually do I need to do as an educational supervisor? And what are some of these aspects that clinical supervisors do that might be different? You can see here then we get into the practice phase. So we don't just talk about effective appraisal skills. We give the opportunity for supervisors to practice doing it in a safe environment to consider how can we make appraisal as educationally impactful as possible because the whole process of supervision it's not just about assessing students and assessing learners it's about making sure that the information the feedback that they're receiving is going to help them to progress so we also give lots of opportunity to to practice giving effective feedback. So really understanding what do we mean by effective feedback, particularly as this is a trainee led or trainee driven process, how can we as supervisors make sure that the feedback we're giving is effective? We look at all of the workplace based assessments that are linked to the curriculum and we go through them in quite a lot of detail to then actually practice using them. So we have some uh, training scenarios and training videos where we actually get our supervisors to practice um, assessing these learners so that once they're in their post and they have their real trainees in front of them, they can start, they, they understand what it is that they need to do and they've actually used the assessment processes before. We talked about the ePortfolio just a moment ago, and um, part of this program is we actually guide people through how to use the ePortfolio and allow space for people to practice um, on a training site so that they know they're not going to be messing up a real trainee's ePortfolio, but they can actually practice inserting their um, supervisor reflections, comments, have a go at completing a educational supervisor's report and really getting to grips to think, well, how does the ePortfolio work and how can it actually make your jobs as supervisors easier if it's used in the way that it's designed? 
we spend some time at the end of this programme to really think about supporting trainees who might be struggling. And as we said before, that are for a number of reasons. So whether it's a, a training issue or a skill gap that people might have, how do you tackle that? But also probably more uh, difficult reasons are those personal situations that trainees might find themselves in, which means that they're struggling and to really think about some strategies that we can come up with to help to support those trainees. As linked to that, we think about the structures that you might put in place locally. So we spend some time with the training programme director to think about the structures they have for supporting trainees in difficulty so that we can share those with the supervisors during this training programme. And lastly, as part of this uh, uh, training block, we think about identifying and, and reviewing trainee progression. So we've heard about ARCPs from MUMTAS. So to really think, well, what do I need to do as a supervisor to make sure that both myself and the trainee are ready for when the ARCP um, is about to, to start? So how can we set trainees up for success to make sure there are no surprises when they get to their end of year review? Next slide, please. The second part of our faculty development package happens just before curriculum implementation. So usually this is maybe the week or, or two weeks before you want to actually start the curriculum with trainees. And this has, has two elements to it, really. So the first is a top up program for the educational and clinical supervisors. This gives them an opportunity to um, ask us any further questions to us to really think about what will you be doing when you uh, meet your trainee for the first time. How can you prepare for that first meeting to really hit the ground running? We give people um, tasks and opportunities to practice things on that practice ePortfolio site. So we'll review how people have got on to think about what extra support um, might be needed. And really focusing on, right, we're going to be you're going to be getting started with the role of a supervisor very soon. So what are the, the, the key things that you need to know now and the key things that you need to start planning in your diaries to make sure that you can balance your time and, and meet your trainees needs? And this is all about maximising the effectiveness of the role of both the educational and the clinical supervisors. So this is that chance to get the supervisors together just before the trainees arrive to think, OK, what are the, the remaining issues and concerns that we need to work through together to make sure you're set up for success? An important part, the second part of this uh, uh, training package is actually a programme for the trainees. And we said before that trainees are a really important part of the faculty. Um, you may not view them as part of the faculty of implementing a curriculum, but if the trainees don't know what they're supposed to be doing, then it's likely that the implementation of the curriculum won't be a success. So we spend time with the trainees um, on their own, so away from the supervisors so that they are relaxed and they're free to discuss and, and, and free to ask the questions that they want to ask. Um, and we, we guide them through what they should be expecting to be as being part of a programme. So what are the expectations that they might be having, but also what expectations are on them in terms of their role as a trainee and what are their rights and responsibilities as part of being, uh, of this, of part of being this uh, part of the programme. We go through with them workplace based assessments so that they know what to expect when they're being assessed by their supervisors. We said before that this curriculum is trainee led, so they should be asking supervisors to be assessed. So as part of that, it's important for them to know and being transparent about how these assessment processes work. So we give them opportunities to go through the workplace based assessments to see what they look and feel like. Uh, mirrored to the sessions that we give to the supervisors, which is about how to give effective feedback, it's important that we train the trainees in how to be receptive to the feedback that they receive and actually to think, well, what are the key points I'm going to take from the feedback to enable me to progress even further? The e-portfolio is owned by the trainee. It's their e-portfolio of evidence. So we guide them through how to structure that. So what do they need to be including in their e-portfolio to enable the supervisor to do their job effectively and on time? And a big part of that is about preparing for appraisals and also preparing for the ARCP at the end of the training year. Um, and we we spend a lot of time with the trainees thinking about, well, what could they do to maximise the opportunities for their own learning and their own development? So what are the things that they could be looking out for in terms of opportunities, whether that be clinical or, or other? And how can they actually uh, take the initiative and, uh, and take charge of their own learning and development um, so they can be successful in the curriculum? Next slide, please. 
So the usual timeline for this, as we've said, is that there are two blocks of training. The first is three months before, and this is usually a three day intensive course for the educational and clinical supervisors. There's a lot of information that these supervisors need to know. So actually three days might sound like quite a lot of time, but it's a very packed program. It's a very intensive course to enable the supervisors to be successful in their roles. And then just before implementation, this is the second package of education, which is a one day program for supervisors, that moment of them to ask any further questions that they might have to go through any concerns and to make sure they're ready for their trainees arrival. And then also the two day program for trainees to set them up for success. So these it, it, there's two packages of education both for three days and they're a combination of programs for educational and clinical supervisors and for trainees. Next slide please. So you may be thinking this is great and this might be a perfect world scenario um, but actually what we've found in terms of our experience over the years both internationally and in the UK is that spending time on quality faculty development and training for the, your supervisors a key to the effective implementation of a curriculum and actually if you don't spend time developing your faculty developing the supervisors and training your trainees and how to be successful in the curriculum that's where we'll see issues and, and, and problems happening in terms of implementation so it is absolutely definitely worth investing upfront before implementation to make sure that people have the knowledge skills behaviors and expertise to be able to succeed in the curriculum next slide please and so thinking about this as a package of education and training i've described hopefully how you can see how this is comprehensive but it goes beyond just the days of training that we offer that actually we still are in contact with all of our international sites to help to support education and training and importantly on the, the visits where we come to deliver training we ensure that both you as a training program director or potential training program director as well as supervisors are ready for curriculum implementation i usually start off our training sessions by saying we won't leave until you know exactly what it is that you need to do in order for this curriculum to be successful and we really do mean that we provide you with all of the tools needed for success provide you with all the materials that you might need to help to support others in terms of supporting their um, uh, the links to the curriculum and the process and really thinking about how do we consistently apply the process of supervision across the whole organization to make sure that everybody is set up for success and that i think takes us to the end of this presentation but there's a bit of time for any questions if people have them but hopefully that gives you an overview of what we provide in terms of education and training that goes alongside curriculum implementation So uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I, I can't emphasize enough how uh, important training the trainers is. And, and it isn't just uh, Tom and the team in London that do this. There are educational teams in Edinburgh and Glasgow who are also are very involved in training the, the, the trainers. It, it, is, it is almost an endless task. We used to talk about painting the fourth road bridge and uh, when you've stopped, you've got to start again. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that is the case. It's quite interesting when we implement it. It's often the e-portfolio that causes the greatest concern, uh, particularly to to uh, to trainers. But in, in general, the 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 trainees get their head around it quite quickly and then train the supervisors. So um, that's that that's a bit of a, a practical uh, experience that we've that that we've 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 had so how there's a question there about how frequency the training sessions are raised i mean tom has talked about the model that he's used uh, in the past when implementing uh, imt uh, in, in internationally but uh, some people have had follow up ones there've been virtual events um uh other 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 people take 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 less and and as we'll talk about a little bit about the end of the afternoon some people simply want uh, certain aspects of training the trainers to support their own programs so it, the, 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 there's no one right answer to how frequency training sessions should be ar arranged uh it it it's uh it, if there is an answer it's, it's usually more than you think okay <laughs> thank you 
So people can keep asking questions on the on the chat on this and on anything else we've talked about today. But I think it's time for us to uh, pass on to Phil Bright, uh, and I'm delighted to to uh, to uh, in, introduce Phil, who's who's a respiratory physician in in the West Midlands. He's one of those heads of school of medicine. He'll tell us how many trainees he's responsible for. Can you tell us, Phil? In total, uh, over, eight, over 800. Over 800. Okay, and uh, and so that that keeps him busy. And when he's not busy, he heads up uh, uh, medically the the specialty recruitment office for, for national recruitment into IMT and indeed all the specialties. Uh, those 32, those 29 specialties and three subspecialties of medicine. So he's going to talk a little bit about how we do fair recruitment in the UK, and I think. We'll touch on uh, how it, in, how it affects international graduates. If 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 not, we can talk about that at the end. So, Phil, over to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, first slide, please. The recruitment into higher specialty training is uh, quite a complex undertaking. There's lots of supportive information on the IMT recruitment site uh, to guide individual trainees. And of course, with the pandemic, we've had to change our processes. The processes are set up to ensure that there is equity and fairness um, for those applying. The interviewers are trained and in particular have to demonstrate that they've been trained in equality and diversity. For higher specialty training, um, the applications are divided into two groups, uh, group one and group two. Essentially, the group one are those programmes where the training includes training in the delivery of, of uh, general internal medicine. So that would be cardiology, respiratory medicine, uh, diabetes and endocrinology, for example. Whereas the group two specialties are those where the programme is just the training in the specialty, such as dermatology. The entry points uh, differ between those two groups. So from the internal medicine stage one programme, you can enter into a group two, you can apply to a group two specialty from year two if you have successfully completed year two. You can't apply to go into a group one specialty until you have completed the uh, full three year programme. And having completed the full year programme, you can then apply into either a group one or a group two specialty. In addition to that, we have trainees who may have finished the core programme and uh, left to go and do something else for one, two, three years. So they can also apply then into either a group one or group two specialty. And we also have this pathway called the alternative certificate, which is for those trainees who haven't done the core programme they can apply to both group one or group two specialties but in general these trainees tend to struggle uh, because they're not familiar with the training regimes that are used uh, in the UK and it takes them a quite a long time to get to grips with both their clinical work and the training programs and the requirements of those training programs. So although that pathway exists, it is very much one uh, that we don't encourage and uh, trainees that do engage on that pathway uh, do struggle and sometimes struggle um, to the point of not being able to complete. Uh, next slide, please. The governance of the programme um, sits within uh, a UK context. So we run the Physician Specialty Recruitment Office, and that's a subdivision of the Medical and Dental Recruitment Office, which is a UK wide undertaking. Uh, it's not just uh, focused in England, for instance, although England is the biggest partner within that. Within the governance processes, we undertake a huge amount of consultation with the specialties about how they want to run their recruitment processes, the different stages, the approaches, and it is always being adapted and changed. We, we have consultation with trainees and we work closely hand in hand with uh, partners who support the statistical analysis of uh, recruitment, 
so that we know which elements of recruitment uh, perform well, which elements of recruitment don't perform so well. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment, we, we, we uh, put all that into a report uh, after each recruitment year. Next slide, please. So the application process opens in November uh, for a prospective start the following August. We have a highly developed application website and portal into which people put their initial application and upload evidence in support uh, of that application. Inevitably, as I said before, because of the pandemic, there's been some flux in that process and where we would normally have face to face interviews uh, that had to be adapted to uh, conform to the constraints of the pandemic. It does differ slightly between each program um, and to get the details on the requirements for each program, uh, I would refer you back to that website I mentioned, which is the IMT uh, recruitment website. Although all programs have a common element to them, uh, the emphasis and in some cases the, the structure does differ slightly. Equally, competition rates uh, vary widely across programs and certainly in the last couple of years, uh, competition uh, level has gone up uh, absolutely enormously. So where in the past some programs, the competition um, meant that uh, as long as you were, you reach the benchmarking threshold, you would be appointed. Now with the competition being so high, um, you have to score quite well to get into posts, particularly posts in desirable uh, parts of the UK. And it is likely that trend will continue at least for the next few years. Um, and is again some sometimes uh, some of that will be a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So if we think through the actual process of applications, let's say it opens in November, and incoming prospective trainees uh, put their application in using the Oriel system, and that is uh, widely advertised, and links are sent out when the posts are advertised. The first part of the process is shortlisting to ensure that trainees applying reach a minimum shortlisting uh, level. In the past, some specialties where the competition wasn't very high didn't really have a shortlisting stage uh, other than to guarantee that you were in fact a doctor. Um, but that has now uh, passed us by and all uh, of the programmes have quite a uh, evolved form of shortlisting. Should an applicant uh, pass shortlisting, they then pass to the interactive interview stage of the recruitment process. And in the past, this used to be a three stage face to face interview and different specialties had a different emphasis on each of those three stations. Certainly last year and the year before, this was changed. So it became a single station, multiple, multiple domain a recruitment process that was done virtually. And the evidence suggests that this was actually quite successful. And it may be that we don't return to a face to face recruitment process. From an international perspective, that has big advantages because it means that people can apply and even undertake the interactive interview stage uh, outside of the UK. Uh, the statistics suggest that this process was as successful um, as the uh, original three stage face to face process and indeed had lots of advantages both for applicants and for those uh, interviewers and for those managing the interview process. Uh, next slide please. Um, appointment is slightly complicated because it, it's not about just how you perform at the interview. Each stage of the application process has a scoring to it. Uh, we develop a whole suite of questions which have uh, prompts and have scores against them. And we train people to use those questions appropriately. Every candidate gets the same question. There's recording of the answers uh, by the interviewers. Different parts of the process have a different weighting score. And in the past, uh, there was no weighting placed on the initial application, but that has, has changed now. 
and the weighted score uh, gives you a ranking and from that ranking you it is decided whether you are appointable and indeed not only appointable but when trainees preference for their posts which of those posts uh, they then get uh, next slide please the whole process is subject to annual review and we go into a great deal of detail about the integrity of the process there is an appeals process uh, built in we uh, seek feedback from applicants as well as from interviewers about how the process went and produce a fairly weighty state of physician recruitment report on a yearly basis which gives details about how the process worked and where we're going to take the process in the coming years as i said at the beginning the process is continuing in a state of change and flux as we adapt uh, both to the environment in which we're having to undertake the recruitment process but also to change needs so for example um, we use uh, domains that score trainees against uh, how they have uh, put in papers um, whether they've been to conferences and we're having to adapt that now to whether trainees have published uh, in social using social media channels um, even on YouTube and we're looking at how we do that successfully and again equitably uh, for all of those who may apply apply to the process next slide please and that's the overview of what is a very complex uh, process that does take up a huge amount of time um, and we're obviously happy to discuss how international trainees uh, can engage with that uh, to the same uh, integrity as their UK uh, colleagues. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Phil. That's that that's that's uh, very helpful. And I put down the reference to your website on the on the uh, chat. Uh, I, I think it, it's just interesting to reflect on. Uh, we've obviously changed the curriculum and the entry requirements now for higher specialty training. Uh, you know, in, in the, you've now got to demonstrate through IMT year three that you are a medical registrar and you are able to run the acute take, which, of course, was not a requirement in the days of core, two year core medical training. Um, and it, it, it does mean that people have got to be able to demonstrate that. And obviously, if you've completed uh, IMT training, uh, you can dem demonstrate that because it's in your e-portfolio. Um, uh, and we know that people who have done our IMT training overseas in one of our accredited programs uh, are being successfully appointed uh, through the, the national re recruitment process. But I think it's going to be much harder in the future for people who have simply done the MRCP uh, as an isolated exam. Uh, and have not been part of a managed training program to be able to demonstrate that they have the competencies uh, to be the medical registrar uh, and therefore to be appointable at, uh, at for higher training. Uh, is, is, is that your observation? Yeah, absolutely. And what we've done is we've now built into the recruitment process for the Group 1 specialties a test. One of the questions will be about uh, managing uh, a, an acute on call. So we will ask people to um, explain how they would deal with a situation, for instance, of uh, multiple requests on the registrar time, prioritisation skills, um, maybe handover skills, all of which are in the role of the medical registrar, yeah. but aren't actually clinical. Um, uh, it, it doesn't require the demonstration of clinical knowledge, but does require that you've worked as a medical registrar and have those skill sets um, principally because it would be a trainee safety issue if you didn't have them you would very much struggle when coming into the program but potentially also a patient safety issue if you didn't have them and were placed in an on-call situation uh, very early on yeah yeah okay good uh, and there's an interesting question is there an age limit uh you know can, can someone at 60 apply for uh, higher training and 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 of course the uh, answer to that is, is that there is no age limit it isn't scored but career progression 
uh, is looked at. Do you, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, so this is a quite a complex area and we very much try not to discriminate. So many UK trainees, particularly recently, um, don't take a direct route in their training path. And maybe we even encourage people to take an indirect route. And there is no discrimination uh, really in place uh, about that. We have a test. One of the domains is commitment to specialty. And within that, so the word being is um, trainees have been able to demonstrate their commitment to specialty relative to their stage of training. Um, so that if you have a trainee who comes directly through the core program and maybe hasn't had time to go and get extra experiences, publish papers, do quality improvement projects, their um, commitment to specialty will be viewed in that light. Whereas someone who has taken longer and has got more evidence their evidence will be viewed in the light that they've gone off and done other things as well. So we try to um, have a degree of um, uh, equality is not the right word, but um, uh, equality of access fairness, depending on fairness. I think fairness is, I think is, is, yeah, is, is probably the, the, the right word. Um, when we uh, interview people, we have no awareness of their age, their ethnic origin. Um, anything like that uh, it, it is in that sense uh, an anonymized process and we look simply at what they've done what evidence they've got um, and we look at that in terms of their training path uh, and try and give a a, a, a balanced uh, score uh, depending on that yeah yeah okay uh, and, and and i think just to comment on on, on numbers uh, because you, you're right you know we, we've gone very rapidly from a situation where we had lots of frankly empty training spaces gaps in our rotors to them all being filled but i have little doubt that that is a as you I think suggested is a covid issue and uh, i think the situation can unravel just as quickly um yeah. uh, once people can travel to the states to australia and new zealand again um so um it's very very difficult i always think for people to make decisions on on competition ratios having said that we always knew that dermatology neurology and cardiology were the most popular specialties and i don't suppose that has that has changed a lot no uh, the the popular specialties remain popular it's just other specialties have become popular within their own right yeah yeah OK, if there are no other questions that have come up, um, thank you very much, Phil. I, I know you've got a very busy day, so so thank you for your time and uh, being able to actually join us. Take care. Bye bye. Right. Well, I'm going to run now the the last session of the day and um, uh, I'm going to call this it's about standards and about program accreditation and about how uh, we can support uh, people in in their own uh, ideas about delivering, uh, in particular, internal medicine training uh, in, in internationally. So if I could have the next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about is our use of an accreditation process. So what is accreditation? Because it discovers a word that many people use for different sorts of processes. So I'll explain how we use a process of accreditation and what the standards we use and then go on just to briefly talk about how federation may be able to help uh, uh, people who, who are on this event so if we could go on to the next slide so here is a definition accreditation is the recognition granted to an institution that meets the standards of criteria established by a competent authority or association but its purpose particularly for education, is to promote and to ensure educational programme quality. So any time we're using it, we're using it to try and improve uh, the quality of what is being delivered. Slide two. Uh, usually it will be a self-assessment and an external peer assessment uh, used to accurately assess their level of performance in relation to established standards and to implement ways to continuously improve. And I, I think this, this, this point about continuous improvement, uh, rather than this being a static, let's just look, oh, you're fine today, which I think many accreditation processes are. You get a badge on the wall, you're fine today. We think it's more important 
to emphasize on the issue of continuously improving. Next slide. Uh, and uh, as we run it uh, uh, through the Federation, it's recognition granted to an institution, an organization, or even a country that their uh, medical education uh, meets the standards set by the Federation of the Royal Colleges of Physicians of the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, and so uh, this is how we run it. We run it through the Federation on a UK uh, uh, basis. So next slide. So what, what, what are the standards that we use? Well, uh, as I've said, the, in the UK, the General Medical Council is the regulator of all training in all specialties. Uh, and uh, it sets generic standards of training and curriculum and as assessment. So we've, we've basically taken those standards and, uh, have, uh, and are applying them for use in an international perspective for physician education. Some of them uh, relate to undergraduates, some of them relate to, to other, other types of specialties. So we're, we're looking at generic ones, which at the end of the day cross all uh, postgraduate training, but ones that specifically will work internationally and ones that will work for physicians. Uh, and if we, next slide please. So if we look at what's within that, then um, there are five themes in those standards. And uh, the first is the learning environment and culture. And number one, is this a safe environment? You cannot train trainees if the clinical environment is not safe. So is that environment, is the culture in which they work supportive? Is it, does it deal with clinical incidents well? Uh, does it implement evidence-based medicine? We are looking for an environment that is appropriate for physicians to learn how to be an expert physician. The second theme is about educational governance and, and leadership. Well, well how, how much effort does, does the organisation put into uh, supporting uh, education? Is there a proper structure for dealing with issues? Is there a amount of resources in place? Theme three is about supporting the learners and the processes that are there to help trainees if they're in difficulty, if there are problems, and to make certain they cover all aspects of the curriculum. Theme four is about supporting educators. Does the organisation train the trainers? We've heard how important that is. So uh, aspects there about supporting. Do they give educators time uh, in order to be able to do the the job. And, and the last theme is about developing and implementing the curricula. Uh, and so from our perspective, next slide, please. The, the curriculum for we would use uh, is, is the curriculum for internal medicine stage one. Uh, and so that's the one we use when we are looking at, at, uh, at physician training, uh, particularly as this goes all the way through uh, most of our specialties, uh, both uh, at stage one and the stage two, uh, and even in those group two specialties, much of that has internal medicine written into it. So it allows us to look generically across the physician training. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, we, we, we've also developed specifically quality criteria previously for core medical training, now for IMT, which again helps organisations look at uh, whether they are really meeting uh, the process that the that, that trainees want. And we also uh, consider those when we are looking at the accreditation uh, pr uh, process. Next slide, please. So uh, what is the quality structure? We, I talked at the right at the beginning about the fact that we had a regulator, the General Medical Council. Then there was an intermediate body, which in the UK are the postgraduate deaneries, but in many other countries are either a university or, or, or a college. So if you look at Canada, uh, they have a regulator, but the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada provides a lot of the, of the training management. And then finally, there are the actual hospitals which are providing the the day-to-day the -day employment and, and uh, training. So you've got these three levels uh, which you can consider uh, the, 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 the process. Uh, 
So if you go on to the next slide. So in general, where we're no, no back one, please. So in general, where Federation does its accreditation, we are usually working at the the college, university or indeed hospital, a large hospital group uh, trust uh, and are reporting to the board or the dean. Uh, we do work with Iceland where we report to the, the regulator as 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 well. Next slide, please. So where it's undertaken on behalf of Federation, as I've said, it is there to promote high quality education. Uh, 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 and uh, we see it as being developmental uh, and a partnership. Uh, as I said, this, this, this is, 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 is accreditation that there, there are various, there's almost a spectrum of how people do it uh, from people with very high uh, structure on the process so they're always looking for documents. Do you know, as an example, handover? Where is the document on handover? We are much more interested in talking to the trainees and finding out what actually happens. Is handover work? Does it work? Does it work well? Is it safe? That is an outcome uh, 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 that, that we see as being important and meeting our standards. We don't actually care if there was a complex written process, particularly if that's put in a filing cabinet and nobody ever looks at it. So our, our process based on, as we have said, in particular, the GMC standards as, as country uh, appropriate and our IMT curriculum where we're looking at internal medicine. We will use a team of uh, two expert UK medical educators and an expert administrator. Uh, the local uh, organisation will do a self-assessment and we will look at that and other data, which I will mention in a minute. We will then interview education teams, trainers and trainees and, and come to a, a judgment as to where they are on the spectrum of accreditation and for how long uh, we think that that process should be uh, allowed for. Uh, and that has to come to the Federation Board uh, to be uh, uh, agreed and and uh, approved. Uh, next slide, please, please, Will. And in terms of data, uh, once a, a site is up and running, we've obviously got the ARCP observations uh, and where we're providing externality, uh, we again, we will use an experienced head of school, someone outside of Federation uh, who, who is uh, used to, to ARCPs in the UK, and they will provide a report at the end of, of, each, uh, of each event. Um, we obviously look where possible at examination results, and also we're using uh, increasingly a trainee survey uh, based on a subset of questions used by in the UK, the GMC. In the UK, every trainee every year is expected to complete a GMC quest survey. That's about 56,000 survey forms. Uh, over 90% will complete it. And that provides a huge amount of data about uh, comparative uh, uh, views of trainees on their training uh, uh, in that specialty, in that site. Uh, and that's all published uh, and is freely available on the GMC website for anyone to have a, a look at. And, and is, is quite useful, not necessarily just for one-off concerns, but, but where you see patterns of change over a number of years. And so we have started, if I could have a look at the next slide, Will, we have started uh, using some of those questions on our international site. So here is a specific question. Have you received feedback in a formal meeting with your educational supervisor about your progress in this post? Uh, and across the bottom, you've got uh, uh, the 13, I think it is 13, 12, 13 uh, UK deaneries, and then three international sites. I've anonymized them, site one, site two, and site three. And you can see how the responses of the trainees, uh, which basically the more green you have, the, the better, uh, works with our international sites and across the UK. So that there are huge differences in the UK 
Uh, but uh, we're also able to show that there is uh, at least uh, uh, our, some of our international sites are at least as good, if not better, than, than what is happening in the United Kingdom. And just to give uh, next slide one other example. Uh, we always like this question. How would you describe this post to a friend who is thinking of imply of applying for it? So, again, uh, green and blue is good. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and anything else, particularly purple, is 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 not so good. So, again, a lot of variation across the UK, although the vast majority of trainees are happy most of the time, but also evidence that what's happening internationally is also meeting uh, trainee expectations. Next slide, please. Will. So we, we essentially have have three levels of accreditation. The, the highest level, level three, is is for those sites that are uh, producing UK equivalent IMT uh, training, and, and we have uh, six six sites uh, un, un, undertaking that, uh, and uh, and and they've all gone through a very detailed process. But we also uh, use uh, level one accreditation to help organisations uh, develop. Uh, people who, who would like a, an assessment of where they are now and suggestions of where they go forward, particularly when they neither wish uh, nor would it be appropriate for them to, to take on board our, our curriculum. We're looking generically at, at, at uh, IMT ed education. So it, it is a process that we can use and, and people might try and move up those uh, over, 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 over time. So uh, next slide, please, Will. So where, where we're at now is that we, we've got six sites that are all quite mature now who are, are have got full level three accreditation and are producing uh, UK equivalent core medical trainees. And, and we've got one who is currently at, at, at level one. Though we are working with a couple of other partners who are hopefully will we'll be doing that in the near future. So finally, You've had a huge, thank you, Will. You've had a huge amount of information uh, today um, about what we're doing in terms of delivering competency-based medical education. Uh, I think the principles about workplace-based assessments, about uh, feedback, about helping people do things better, uh, about having a review of all their activities, not just relying on exams, is very much a model that is being implemented certainly across uh, the Western world. Uh, you look at Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, uh, the USA, uh, etc. This is very much the movement over the last uh, 15 years. Um, People who have worked with us say, well, how, you know, some people say, well, well we'd like to, to do this. Well, this, this is uh, about a, a relative model. It takes about six, probably 12 months to get started. And then is going to be a very intensive uh, period of, of, of work uh, as people get up to speed. Once you've been running for 18 to 24 months, things settle down. There is a regularity to it. Uh, it, it, it. It ticks over. People know what they're, they're, they're doing. But it is not, uh, whether you're doing it with us or whether you're doing it on your own, uh, the, the, the change to a, a, a real competency-based medical education uh, structure is very, very challenging. I mean, uh, we've been at this realistically since 2004. Uh, of course, our, our IMT curriculum is our second uh, generation uh, ed medical education curriculum, having learned from the experiences of the past. So uh, never think about curriculum development and implementation as being a simple one off process. Uh, just think back to that training the trainers and uh, the the cohort of people that you have to bring up to to, to 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 speed. From my perspective, it's worthwhile, but it is uh, challenging. So the far, final slide of today is 
and, and this, this will lead on to what else we can do is is you know you've all signed up to this because you're you were interested in IMT or or you're already involved in one way or another and are trying to move to the next level. Um, there are ways that we can help. Uh, clearly, we can do nothing, which is fine. Uh, some people simply want us to give an informal uh, assessment. Some people want uh, Tom in London or in Glasgow and Edinburgh to offer just faculty development to what they're they're doing. Some people are developing a local curriculum and would look help would like help with some of the the CBME elements, be those our workplace based assessments or, or advice to our expertise on how to set up and run ARCP panels. Some people might be in, interested in trying to develop a uh, full IMT or in getting what they're doing locally uh, accredited. And, and we're able to help with, with all of those. Certainly in terms of today and bringing this to a close in, in, in a moment, uh, Will will be sending out those uh, CPD certificates. Uh, he will also be asking for some feedback from you uh, about what we've done, uh, how it worked, what worked well, what didn't work so well, how we can do better uh, next next time. Uh, and I think he will also be offering to any organisation or team that wants it a one to one session uh, with a video conference with myself and Will uh, sometime uh, later in 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 the month. So um, uh, I'm going to finish there. I, I, I hope this is this has been uh, of of interest. Uh, I hope it's been uh, of uh, it will help you in your thinking with trainees. And yes, to answer Dr. Hanif, do we have follow up sessions? I've said and you've got it there on the slide. If you email Lynn or Will uh, uh, after this, then uh, he, he he will set up uh, sessions with myself and Will uh, and he will be our, in fact, he'll be writing to everyone asking that. So. Um, I'm going to finish there, and uh, unless anyone's got any burning comments, um, we've managed to finish on time, and I hope it's been a useful session.